Richard Serrett's Strange Planet, following the truth wherever it leads, exposing evil and corruption and the secret machinations of powerful elites, revealing the high strangeness beneath the surface of our supposed reality, coming to you from the Great White North and his studio beneath the stairs. Here's Richard. Well, you found us. This is The Conspiracy Show. My name is Richard Serrett, and thanks for inviting me into your home, and thank you, most of all, for your ears. I'm a little out of breath. I, uh, between breaks here, I'm just, or during breaks, I'm just running down the hall uh, to the boardroom uh, to check on my little guys. Uh, my twin boys are camping out here with me tonight. Every uh, so often, I like to bring them down to the, uh, the radio station so they can see where the old man works, and uh, they're having a great time. They're just about asleep, uh, so... I'm going to race down there again in about 14 minutes just to make sure all is quiet. I hope you'll join me for something else. It's called Follow the Truth, the Conspiracy Show Summit. On Sunday, November the 16th, I'm going to be hosting this all-day conference-style event with six incredible speakers. Don Schmidt, Roswell investigator. Jim Penniston, witness to the Rendlesham Forest UFO incident. Professor Ron Mallett on time travel. Patty Greer on crop circles. Jim Elvidge. Uh, author of The Universe Solved, will be talking about whether or not we're living in a matrix. Richard Dewhurst uh, will be talking about ancient giants who ruled America. More details and ticket info at www.followthetruth.tv. For the last several months, I have been inundated uh, with tweets and emails uh, from listeners wanting me to do a program about Bigfoot. And I promised I would do that. And uh, typically, when I do a show about Sasquatch, I end up speaking to someone from the Northwest, British Columbia, Washington State, Oregon, California. In fact, when I did a, a television show on, on Bigfoot, an episode, uh, we, we, went, we went out to California. We, because we tend to think that Sasquatch only dwells in the, in the rainforests of the Pacific Northwest, and that's simply not the case. There have been sightings in, of, of Bigfoot in all 50 states, including Rhode Island, if you can believe it, and all 10 provinces, including the province of Ontario, from where this program is emanating. Ontario lists close to, I think it's nearing 100 sightings now, from as far back as 1906. There was one in Cobalt, Ontario. And uh, in 2010, in Lake Superior Provincial Park, each case is sort of quasi-scientifically investigated. The site operators interview witnesses where possible. Some sightings are obviously weak cases for the Sasquatch's existence. There are people who claim they've heard Sasquatch rather than actual sighting. Others are, well, I guess up to the, the reader to, dis- to decide. Uh, more recently, I believe it was June of this year, at least that's when the story and the video was posted. It was stamped June 2014th. Uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Tim Everick of the Ontario Wildlife Field Research, Ontario, Bigfoot. Um, I believe there was an image of uh, what they they think may have been a Sasquatch captured on a GoPro video camera. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but uh, in southern Ontario, there have been three fairly recent sightings in Dundalk, Ontario, back in 1987, Markdale, Ontario in 1995, and St. Thomas in 2007, and the latter Bigfoot uh, sighting was on the Elgin Trail, and it's perhaps the most convincing. Now, I mentioned the Ontario Wildlife Field Research Ontario Bigfoot Group, and I have one of its members on the line with me now. Christine Burns is a member of the aforementioned Ontario Wildlife Field Research Ontario Bigfoot Group. She's had a long career as a registered nurse. She's also a holistic health practitioner who has studied under Ojibwa healers. She had her first face-to-face Bigfoot encounter when she was approximately 10 years old in a wooded area in South Porcupine, Ontario. Her first Bigfoot tracking expedition was in 2012 on Vancouver Island, where she and her late husband became educated in Bigfoot habitat, behaviors, tracking, casting, and evidence collection. Christine Burns, welcome to The Conspiracy Show. How are you? Well, I'm good. And I'm, I'm very impressed with what you've already researched. 
I hope I can add to a lot of that. Well, yeah, I, I'm, I am, I'm fascinated by a Sasquatch. Never uh, have come close to a sighting. Uh, I've done a number of shows on it, a little bit of research, but I am absolutely fascinated by it. Uh, and, and obviously, my listeners are because, as I say, they, you know, they've been they've been letting me know they've they, they've wanted me to do a show about this for some time, and it's been a while. So here we go. Let's 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 go back. Let's dial it back. Uh, to South Porcupine when you were 10 years old. Uh, walk us through what happened, Christine. Well, I always used to, uh, the uh, wooded area was very close to uh, where I lived. It was only a block or two away. And as kids, we always went up and uh, played in that area where, you know, we'd find uh, raspberry canes and blueberries and do kids what kids do. Um, and um, so I, I was never really a... Um, afraid of going into the bush by myself. I mean, at that time, we didn't have all the warnings about bears. I can remember my mother, you know, if a bear came in the yard, we'd go out with a broom, you know. And so it, there was no really, um, nothing that really kept us from, like, going up there if we were, say, on our own and meet up as, uh, with pals. So I happened to know that the time of the year that I was up there, um, there was raspberry canes, and that's what I went up to collect. So what happened when um, I was, um, there was new houses that had built along that that stretch of road called Legion Drive, and a lot of that time the bush was just pushed back. So there was a lot of ridges and, and kind of gullies back there where they had just dumped the um, brush area. And that's where the raspberry canes would grow. So I was picking uh, raspberries and reaching my hand through the bushes while I was a bit on an angle. And as I put my hand up to uh, reach in and grab some of these berries, um, two hands came out, and there I was face to face with something that I never imagined I would ever see. Um, I fell backwards kind of off of the thing, and I can remember um, the face is still very vivid in my memory, um, and I remember running like hell back home. And I knew instinctively that no one would really believe me. I knew this wasn't some person in the bush. I knew it was not a bear. Um, very schooled at, ha- you know, knowing what a bear looks like. What, 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 walk me through. What did it look like exactly? You know what? It was um, long hair uh, that I remember that. I remember the hands having some hair, but they were very, very huge hands. And... Um, uh, what I remember the most um, was um, kind of the way it was staring at me in as much wonderment as I seemed to be staring at it. There was almost like a, a facial expression of frowning and looking at me. I remember the nose very more human-like and not a gorilla, not flat and squashed like you see the, you know, the pictures we see of gorillas. But I remember the most part was like the eyes were like a hazel-like eyes. You know, I've read since then that, you know, these they kind of are supposed to, in the dark, will have a red glow. But I just remember so much that they were of a light hazel color. And, and what, and what color was, excuse me, Christine, I'm sorry, what, yeah. what, what color was the hair? Um, the hair was reddish and, and dark. It was almost like a um, lighter across the top of the head that came down. Um, and I remember very much seeing, like, straggly hair hanging on what, what I could see of the neck and shoulder, which wasn't much. Uh, whether this animal was on the other side of, of the hump or whether it was down, kneeling down to look at me, I don't know. I, I just know that um, it looked um, wild. It looked wild, but it also looked human-like. So we're talking about hair, long hair, not fur. No. To me, it was... It was like like you would um, hair hanging in long, long strings, and some almost curly, but definitely lighter on the upper part towards the, the shoulder looked darker. Now that could have been from the shading and the, um, the shadowing as well. And uh, was this creature was it was it bent over? I mean, were you looking? Was it hunched over? You were looking straight into its eyes, or were you looking up at it? Um, I was at an angle kind of up at it, so when it looked at me, it was kind of like, it was definitely, the face was higher than mine, but it kind of angled down to look at me, like like inquisitive. To me, it, 
you know, when I think back on it, I would think the animal must have crouched down to look at me. That's the only impression I can get because, I mean, as a child, I was just locked on the face. I was locked on the face, and and um, the details of uh, covered by the, the hands coming through the raspberry canes were obviously like you know um, showing that it was it was down at some kind of level. Any any idea how how large this this creature was? Oh, the the head was very large. Was very large. How tall? Any idea? No, I couldn't. I couldn't estimate even as a child. Even now, I can very much picture the face, but but any other details are kind of um, not not within my scope of remembering at that kind of stage. The hands though were large. There were there were fingernails. The ha- and the skin too was not necessarily dark or or blackish. It was more like a um, I hate to you know more like a the redness and the, you know, of a, of a burnish brown. Right. And and any way of, of identifying whether this may have been a male or female? No. Um, you know, I, I remember as I ran away um, thinking, um, nobody's, nobody's going to believe me. And so there was this sense, and I, I, I know now from reading, there's a sense of, of the fact that um, people often don't remember um, what they've actually seen. Um, it's almost like the um, um, they're actually the Seminole uh, Indians um, believe that um, that they are capable of causing um, a type of memory loss. This might be related to uh, the fact that there has been um, much discussion about them using. Um, uh, infrasound. All right, listen, Christina, I, I hate to interrupt. i got to take a quick break. We'll come back. Yep. Christine Burns talks about her Bigfoot encounter here on The Conspiracy Show. Don't go away. The truth goes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. opposed. Third, it is accepted as self-evident. self-evident. You're listening to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. All right, little guys are tucked in and finally asleep, I think, uh, down the hall, so we can uh, resume our conversation with Christine Burns, uh, who is uh, revealing or detailing her uh, encounter, her close-up, face-to-face encounter with a Bigfoot in South Porcupine, Ontario. Where is South Porcupine, uh, for those not in the know, Christine? uh, Northern Ontario. It's uh, now part of Timmins City Limits. Timmins. Okay, that fixes it in my mind. And I think actually, I uh, during a family vacation, we we rolled through South Porcupine at a certain point. Now, I know better than to ask women how old they are, but I'm doing the math. I know you graduated from nursing in 1972, uh, so and you this happened when you were about 10. So we're talking about the early 60s. Yes. Now you've heard this a million times, Christine. But for the record, you know people are going to say that was. Fifty years ago, Christine, the mind can play a lot of tricks. How do you know you saw what you saw and that you're not remembering a dream or something like that? Well, I would have to say that when you experience something like that as closely as I did, it it imprints, right? We're all attracted to the mystery of the Sasquatch or Bigfoot, right? I mean, let's face it, he's the monster that lives in our backyard, and we have lots of backyards in our country. There's truth in the fact that people have had these experiences, just like mine, but they don't come forward. And I didn't come forward as a child. I instinctively knew that if I was to say that I had seen, say, I would have quoted a gorilla in, you know, in the bush. I mean, nobody would have paid any attention. Or, and and there's always even a child is afraid afraid of ridicule. And we find this now even in adults that have had experiences. They want, you know, they mention it, and and all, obviously people, you know, um, have this attitude of uh, dismissing what they've seen. So, as the Ontario Wildlife Field uh, research people, we face the problem that people will report to us, but we always keep everything totally confidential. We want to take reports because we want to track sightings. Um, 
you know, uh, I think that um, if I could use um, uh, Algonquin Park, um, there has been 200 sightings. Um, now, those have been those have been reported in in some way or form or video or by mention. Um, 200 but, sightings in prevent in the provincial park alone. Yes, there's been 200 uh, sightings in Algonquin Park. It's a perfect environment. It's sure. over 7,630 square kilometers. The interior is only accessible by canoe. Um, there's coniferous and deciduous forest. It's the climate. There's a great um, uh, analogy that we can make now between areas where there are Sasquatch sightings and the amount of precipitation that's received in that area. Interesting. Listen, I, I want to come back to Algonquin in, in a moment, but I just stay. Uh, I want to stay with your sighting for just a few more moments. Okay. Um, was this creature? Did it appear to be menacing at all? I think it. For I've really got the impression when I see the face movement that it was looking at me, um, maybe trying to figure out who I was or what I was. Um, I was um, small, um, blonde-haired. Um, there has been um, some um, uh, reports that um, that there's a preference to blondes, that a lot of blondes have had uh, sightings. I don't believe this animal shows itself. It's known as being sneaky. I don't think it shows itself in, unless it wants to to view what's on the other, what its perception is trying to form. This um, this could have been a young. Um, Bigfoot, and just as curious um, uh, to see me. As, sure, sure. And I, that's that's quite logical. Um, did you even know what Sasquatch was at that point? Had you heard stories about Sasquatch? Never, never. I didn't. I knew that I I had seen something that looked like a gorilla, but wasn't a gorilla. It wasn't a wild man living in in the bush, um, you know, an old prospector or anything like this, it was definitely, to me, it was an animal that looked like a man in many ways. And you had the, you were able to get up and and run. I mean, many people may have been paralyzed by fear, but you got up and you, you, you made your escape. Yeah. <laughs> and when you I got... I fell backwards. Mm-hmm. And some of that I can't remember. I do remember watching my feet running because I didn't want to trip and fall. Uh, in my mind, it was like if I fell, um, but th- I wasn't being chased. Um, I was just running from my own fear. It didn't pursue you. No. So you got home, and, and what happened? You just you you stayed quiet and told not nary a soul for years and years and years. No, I think it's like um, I think it's like when I talk about the the mystery of of the Sasquatch. It's like it's the monster in our backyard. <laughs> you know. It, Children don't start. We don't start telling stories about monsters under our beds, and and to me at that time, um, I just felt like that not not discussing it didn't give any reality to that monster that's out in the bush. Um, when were you able to connect the dots? Did you did you see a, a movie, read a book about Sasquatch, and say, bingo, that's what I saw? I guess I was I was um, probably in my teens or whatever, and there was there was um, m- uh, many things around the the Patterson um, uh, Gim- Gimlet. Um, the Patterson Gimlet, was, yeah, sure. Yes, and and uh, Gimlin, yes, and and so that was really um, quite um, public, and and then I it's, I felt kind of validated that like you know that 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 I saw does exist. And when there was all the controversy over whether it was, um, you know, staged or whatever, um, I knew instinctively, no, I, that, I know that, that that can't be staged. And then, of course, there was the, um, there was the movie that was about um, Harry, the, Harry and the Hendersons or right, whatever right. and all that. And, and, um, and I just felt that, no, this, this, this at the time I said animal, um, I know exists. I've had my own experience. Um, I didn't really need it to feel that I had to share it with anybody because uh, what was the point? As you said, I was like 10. Somebody can easily say, well, you don't remember or it's something that you dreamed. Um, but um, 
but the but the Patterson Gimlin uh, film, um, you know, to me right away I knew no, that's that must have been what I saw. That's what must have been looking at right. me. Right. Right. Now you you, you uh, graduated from nursing in seventy two and 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 uh, had a, a a long nursing career. Uh, you married a police officer from North Bay. Yes. Uh, at at what point? Uh, because I know that you and your your late husband traveled out to Vancouver Island, and you went on your first Bigfoot expedition, but only a couple years ago. At what point did you decide I have to do something with this? I you know I had this face to face encounter. Was it always in the back of your mind that you were going to pursue this? Not until my son, uh, uh, after his military career, was uh, posted out to Vancouver Island. And that's where he retired. And um, he he um, found out that um, the area that he lives in Comox Courtney, there's been a lot of um, Bigfoot activity, Sasquatch. And um, he, so he started talking to me about it. And and um, uh, he said that he was um, wanting to go on um, on a Bigfoot expedition, and that he thought that it would be uh, wonderful for uh, David and I, my husband and I to go out there as a retirement gift, and he would, um, you know, pay for us to go on this expedition. And um, that's when I shared with, um, I had shared with my son that I had an experience because he was um, reading an awful lot about uh, Vancouver Island and and uh, the B.C. and the Pacific Coast. And um, the uh, so, so when he knew that I had had a childhood experience, that's what popped into his mind is, well, let's go. And my son now is um, an investigator for the BRFO. Um, he's um, he's uh, really enjoying his. Um, it's not a hobby. It's um, he's um, quite in, engrossed in this, and so that's why um, I've gone again um, an expedition in 2013 and to um, in 2014. I go for the education. Um, I would have to say that I am. A hands-on investigator. Um, I like going out. I like looking for signs. Um, you know, stick structures. I would love to find a footprint. Hair samples. Um, that's what intrigues me: is being out there in the environment. Um, and we have the environment right here in Ontario. We have the same um, ability to find more of um, the evidence of. Uh, and hopefully someday scientific, the scientific community will accept that uh, Bigfoot exists. We have, um, we have uh, footprints, we have uh, handprints, we have fingerprints, we have hair samples. The only thing that's lacking um, is, uh, is a body, and any of us who do investigate uh, Bigfoot, uh, let's Something maybe that we really don't want to have happen in a, in a strange way. <laughs> well, you, you said something interesting in your in your in your bio that you sent me. You said I I don't want to find Bigfoot. I want Bigfoot to find me. What do you mean by that? There's um there's a an Ojibwe um, belief that the and I, I feel that as well that it's um it's a spirit animal and that um, if you have the right intention, it will show itself. And um, I, I believe that really and truly. I don't want it to learn from human investigation that we're trying to encroach on it or that we're trying to harm it. So I, I believe that, um, and I, I've met many other investigators uh, feel that way too, that when we're out and we're uh, walking the, the uh, mountain uh, roads and trails at night and we're we're doing calling and wood knocks and screams. We're trying to have the Sasquatch see us and come into our, say, our base camp or follow us to look at what we're doing. Why are we trying to behave like them? What's the connection? When you say that that it is a spirit animal, uh I mean, what what does that mean exactly? Are we talking about maybe a creature that that may exist in more than one dimension at one time? I'll give, for example, um, I have heard from uh, certain Bigfoot trackers that they have tracked uh, footprints 
uh, into the woods, let's say in the snow, for example, and the footprints suddenly stop. They don't go anywhere, um, which might suggest maybe this creature left this dimension and, and kept walking into another dimension. I don't know. I mean, I don't want to get too woo-woo here, but I mean, what, what, what that sort of seems to be the logical extension of what a spirit animal might be. What, what are your thoughts? Well, I've had I've had one investigator actually state that, um, uh, and she uh, works in the forest industry, that she actually had um, a full sighting of a Sasquatch. And as she looked at it, it suddenly it disappeared. I call it ghosting. We don't know what capabilities these animals have. We do feel that they see uh, infrared. That's why uh, cam, uh, like um, recorders for trail cams, don't work. There's many humans that can see infrared as well. So they avoid uh, the cameras, the infrared. We also know that they can do um, what I've said before, um, the uh, infrasound. Um, they believe that it's kind of... Um, the. I know that the uh, tiger is being uh, in, uh, studied for that. Their roar is able to make someone freeze um, and actually have even a memory loss because of the, the shock and the... Inf- it, that um, uh, the vibrations. So, do we really know? I mean, I know that um, um, the natives um, don't talk about them necessarily uh, disappearing. Um, but uh, as I said before, the the Seminole Indians believe that they are able to give us uh, the ability to forget due to a hypnotic effect that they have. And um, and that again uh, relates to the infra infrasound that uh, is capable of predators. When, when we're coming up on a break here, uh, Christine. When we come back, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, your investigations, your expeditions to Vancouver Island uh, with your son and uh, your late husband. I, uh, am I correct? Yes. Your, 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 you yes. lost your husband. Uh, now he was a criminal investigator, and uh, you also mentioned something in your bio that. Um, here he is, a criminal investigator. It's all about the evidence for him. Your, 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 your husband, late husband, sounded like sort of a no-nonsense guy, yet he was convinced by the available evidence that, that if you had to stand up in court, you could prove the existence of, of Bigfoot. Is that correct? That's correct. He was a forensic science um, uh, a tech and also a criminal investigator. And when he went out, quite honestly, in our first expedition, he was skeptical but um, being seeing and um, visualizing the evidence um, that the um, investigators out there presented to us and through education and um, uh, actual pictures and whatever, my, my husband stated that in a court of law, if he had to if he presented the evidence that is out there, uh, a court of law would have to uh, come with a verdict that Sasquatch exists. All right, Christine, hold on. Christine Burns from the Ontario Wildlife Field Research Ontario Bigfoot Group back with more of The Conspiracy Show. Stay with us. It's time to redefine reality. This is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. And uh, say hello on Twitter at Richard Serrett. Christine Burns is with us. She had her first face-to-face Bigfoot encounter when she was approximately 10 years old in a wooded area in South Porcupine, Ontario. That's up near Timmins. And her first Bigfoot tracking expedition was in 2012 on Vancouver Island, where she and her late husband became educated in Bigfoot habitat, behaviors, tracking, casting, and evidence collection. Um, Did any of, have any of your expeditions out to Vancouver Island um, yielded any significant evidence, uh, video, photography, audio recordings, anything like that, Christine? Um, the my first expedition uh, when we were out there, uh, we were doing we were uh, learning how to um, do screaming or calling, and uh, we actually had a um, a response. Um, this um, uh, this the the second expedition that I went on. Um, we seem to have a, a, a lot of um, activity at night um, for the group. We were, seem to be uh, uh, 
we felt like there's also a sense of, well, I should mention this, there's also a sense of, of feeling that you, you know that something's around. It's a very, we, for us, it's a very instinctual thing, you know. And um, when we were uh, all um, as a group at our base camp, the, um, the um, kind of formulating the last of our investigative skills and what we had been researching, um, we were all sitting around and um, a tree was felled uh, right behind us, just pushed down. Um, <laughs> uh, we immediately froze uh, because that's one of the things that, um, you know, if you've seen any of uh, uh, YouTubes or whatever, often um, a tree will get pushed over. It's almost like a warning. Yes, yes. And um, we all kind of froze. And then, as we all know, you don't want to all rush because you don't want to destroy any evidence. So uh, the primary investigators um, went up, um, marked the area for looking for any prints and that, and um, I didn't. I didn't myself go up. Uh, it was like on a on a slope of the land. We were uh, near a lake edge, so so it was up on the on the slope. And um, I'm sure that that was recorded as that we had, something had come down towards our base camp and and more or less giving us the. Uh, <laughs> the warning. <laughs> you mentioned the um, calls. So you you um, you put out a call. So what we do is we break up into groups and we find um, a valley or uh, a long ridge line or whatever, and then we um, the investigators um, uh, scout out the area that we're going to set up a base camp. Um, they only we only get the longitude and latitude of where we're going uh, just before we leave for the expedition. That's so that we can prevent anybody, um, eliminate any hoaxing or anything, not done by any of the investigators going in there, but just, just for the sake of that we're trying to keep this uh, as a pure investigation as we can. So we go up onto the different ridges and we have different groups, and what we decide to do is um, someone, um, will, a female, uh, will uh, scream uh, down that um, valley or ridge line. Uh, hoping to get a response, then um, uh, we um, we have recorders, and we also wait and listen for them any any responses, and then maybe um, male um, in one of the other groups will do the type of uh, call that would be uh, similar to what a, a male Sasquatch would make, and so what we're trying to do is um, is uh, actually make any Sasquatch in the area realize that there's a female and a male in, in their territory. Um, it could be seen as that um, uh, it could bring responses. We seem to get more responses out of uh, wood knocks, and that has got to be some kind of a messaging system. One thing to be said, you never do one knock. One knock has been recognized as being confrontational. So it's always two knocks, and then we wait for a period of time to see if there's any response. Um, it's um, it, it's amazing when we consider the height that we're, um, of the elevation that we're at, and how far that those screams and those knocks can carry down these um, these areas. Right, and, right. <laughs> and it will, you know, it's you you realize that a lot of the uh, knocks that are responded back are even louder than than uh, what we've been able to make as a human. So you, so then you make maybe make the assumption that whatever is knocking back is certainly huge, or, um, and very I'm, close by, perhaps. And close by. Um, Listen, I got I got to run here. We got another time out. We'll come back in in okay. a few moments and discuss more. Christine Burns is with us, and uh, she is with the Ontario Wildlife Field Research Bigfoot Group. Back with more of the Conspiracy Show. Stay with us. As you're staring up at the night sky, ever wonder who's staring back? You're listening to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. And we've got about another 15 minutes uh, with Christine Burns from the Wildlife Field Research Ontario Bigfoot Group. And uh, Christine, I want to I want to focus on Ontario and perhaps Algonquin for the, the for the remainder of the program. Uh, I mentioned earlier about this uh, video. It was taken on a GoPro camera uh, up in Algonquin by uh, I, I'm not sure if it was, the video was taken by Tim Everick. Um, 
Now, was that June of this year? Do you know? Um, I know that um, uh, I've seen um, a few written reports of that, but I'm not sure if I've actually seen the, the video or which one it is. Um, I believe it was on um, a road, if I'm not mistaken, and they were driving along, and then uh, when they looked at it later, they could see that there was um, a, a figure standing on the side of the road. Right, that that's correct? the one. That's, that's the one. one. The year, uh, I'd have to defer to my administrator who would okay. know for sure. <laughs> but as you say, 200 sightings in Algonquin, and, and these are dating back uh, how long? How far? Do you know? I, I believe they're dating back to when the, the park was um, – the park used to be uh, logged, and there was actually residencies in the park. And then that was changed, I believe, in the 1930s, if I'm mistaken. And, and so it became more of a um, – uh, a, a park setting. So a lot of the sightings came from uh, uh, back when the park was first um, uh, used for logging. When Tommy Thompson was was paddling Canoe Lake. Yeah, probably. <laughs> mm. And uh, um, sorry, I go just, ahead. I just wanted to get back again to that. Like you know, it's it's um it's a vast um, uh, park uh, between Georgian Bay and. Um, and the, the, um, the climate is perfect. As I, I said again, the precipitation is um, 50 millimeters or more, which has been correlated to um, habitat for a Sasquatch um, if the monthly precipitation uh, is above that. And that can be, um, you can see that on, um, uh, if you look at um, the Internet. They, there, I know that um, I have recent active uh, areas. In 2002, in Algonquin Park, uh, Cripple Creek, there was a sighting. In 2009, at Rain Liver, River, sorry, Rain Lake, and in 2010, I believe was the video. Um, um, there was um, no. In 2010, there was a cabin on the uh, Algonquin property that had some um, malevolent activity. And I believe the, the video that we're talking about now was on a later uh, date, more frequent, more uh, recent. Um, I think that you can f- uh, find um, most of that information uh, on the Bigfoot forum if people are interested. I wanted to uh, just mention the Algonquin natives. Um, they acknowledged that there were two types of Bigfoot. The first one was called Genosqua. And it was more prevalent in the east here. And it was um, known by the natives to be cannibalistic. Oh, my. Uh, m- meaning that it was uh, more violent towards men and uh, would abduct them for, um, obviously, um, eating. They, they described uh, him as a stone man. And that was due to a very, very strong skin that was on this animal. They would uh, try and, um, you know, kill this animal, and apparently uh, its chest would, um, it wouldn't um, puncture. So they called him a stone man, and that he, they related it that this, the behavior of, of the Genosqua was he hunts at night and kills by ripping the heads or twisting the neck. So often deer are found with their necks twisted right round. Oh, Christine, I almost wish I hadn't heard about that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and here I was hoping, uh, hope against <laughs> hope, that these are these these wonderful wild men of the woods are such peaceful creatures, and then you had to totally disabuse me of that. <laughs> but they were talking about different temperaments because I know uh, the Pacific uh, area. They they do talk about that they seem that the nature of Sasquatch out there are more benevolent. Now we don't we aren't finding any uh, Genesqua. Um, uh, you know, uh, people being uh, cannibalized or whatever. So whether it was at a, you know, and we're going back to the Algonquin natives um, feeling that there was different types. But you know what? Um, I think a lot of things when um, with the Sasquatch or Bigfoot, when there's human encroachment, they move on. Um, and so, so if this type of Sasquatch exists here and is found to be a little more um, malevolent. And I only say that because we've had um, cabins that have been had rocks thrown at them and, and some trashing. 
But all those things, when that has happened, there's never been any human um, uh, uh, killings or whatever associated with any of that. It's just more of an aggressive behavior to try and remove the human um, contact. So uh, at least two species here in Ontario, I was going to ask you, because I'm sure somebody at some point has, has sort of compared, contrasted the audio recordings of these of different uh, of Sasquatches from different parts of North America and found, you know, profound differences in the calls. Perhaps is is that is that uh, something that's been done? Do you know? Yeah, I I believe that it, I'm not so sure about the calls. I know that there. Um, my experience is, uh, of course, um, that the calls are similar here as in as out west. But um, there most there seems to be more of a difference in. Maybe the um, amount of hair, uh, uh, maybe the, the tracks and the feet are the same size. They're anywhere to 18, 20 inches. Uh, the, the definite, um, by the depression that the print makes, we know that they're like five, 600 pounds. Um, so there's, there's a great similarity, but uh, around the world, of course, we see the difference in, um, you know, the Yeti, um, the uh, swamp ape in Florida. Uh, there just seems to be an ad- adaptation, I believe, to the environment. I, I was thinking back to that uh, rather chilling description you mentioned of the uh, the uh, cannibalistic uh, species, uh, or, or um, I don't know what to call them, not a species, but uh, the the, uh, the cannibalistic Bigfoot that the Algonquin Indians described. Mm-hmm. And a uh, gentleman who's uh, been on Coast to Coast a number of times, David Polides, who wrote a book called oh, yeah. uh, um, Missing uh, 411, about all these odd disappearances in state parks. And I'm wondering, I'm just trying to, I'm connecting the dots where I don't really want to connect the dots. I mean, do you, do you, do you think there may be, I'm asking you to speculate here, a connection between Sasquatch and these these odd disappearances of people in in state parks and maybe even provincial parks? Personally, yes. I believe there is a definite um, correlation between um, the areas of sightings for Sasquatch and the areas of uh, disappearance of people in these parks. Um, I mean, the reality is that um, that David Palladis has definitely done his homework and and there certainly uh, raises questions. He never in his books um, to my knowledge, ever says that they are uh, related to um, Bigfoot, but if you overlay the map, um, it's um, it's quite um, impressive. Well, has it, does this change the way you you think about this spirit animal? I mean, all of a sudden now it's a little bit more menacing, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, um, I. I, I used to go looking for evidence on my own. Um, you know, I, uh, I I canoed and kayaked, and I would go up, uh, um, you know, little streams and whatever, because I felt if I watched the riverbanks, I might see where there's a trail that, um, you know, even uh, finding a print. And uh, because uh, there, there, we know that um, that um, that tomogamy area is quite an active area, and so. Um, you know, and that's where I, I camp uh, up in that area. Um, I've given more thought to it now that, you know, gone on expeditions and they say never go alone. You most certainly should never go alone. And, um, and um, areas that are, um, that are um, quite vulnerable or hiking alone, especially in a rugged territory where there's rocks and, and hills and... and um, um, those kind of places that we know that Sasquatch will um, have to um, probably for game to cap game um, hides uh, in one area and when um, when the elk or whatever come down through they grab the legs they break the legs and you know then the animal can't escape. These are formidable but, hunters. Mm-hmm, they are, and so um, whether they see us as food, I don't think so. But I mean, if you wander into their territory. We don't know when and if there's a mating season. Uh, when's it most? Um, uh, when would you be most vulnerable to actually, you know, come across um, an, you know, an area that they might be uh, 
um, nesting or are um, building uh, their structures. So I have a different thought on it now, but at, uh, at one time I wouldn't have thought anything about going and looking. And, why, and why are they uh, – you mentioned these structures. I, I, I'd like to just pursue that. Just to, We only have a few minutes left here. But these structures, that, uh, what are we talking about? Nests, temporary shelters? Um, they make um, structures that, um, that are almost teepee-like. Um, they're quite um, – there'll be um, – there's no reason for, say, the tree to have fallen over. There actually might be actually tree limbs from another – uh, say like an oak or a birch or or uh, something that, and they make these structures, and they seem to be um, making uh, a place for a habitat. Um, and so um, I I look for those kind of things, um, and um, and I actually did find something out west that I took a picture of, but they're they're quite specific. Um, they're also we've. Uh, there's evidence of seeing where they take limbs and, and weave them in amongst. So they'll take a, a limb and weave it in amongst other trees. Now, that doesn't o- occur naturally, and it might be eight feet above the ground. There's also where they've seen a lot of things where they will in, uh, uh, make um, twines and, and, and look like they're being artistic. They're making some kind of form. There's also a, a lot of... Um, uh, literature about stick structures that they put on the ground. So, so they definitely are using their environment for habitation. Uh, caves. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, literature about caves and use it, the use of caves. And any idea uh, how many breeding pairs might be in Algonquin? I mean, what would be the, 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 the minimum in order to sustain a population, given that there have been 200 sightings there? Any idea? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I would, I, I would believe that Algonquin Park would be a stable environment for them. They wouldn't be migrating. There's lots of, um, there's lots of discussion about whether they migrate. Um, I don't believe that in the, the environment that Algonquin Park would provide um, that there would be any necessary. I mean, there's plenty of game, um, there's plenty of water, lakes, and isolation. Uh, why would they? Why would they move? But um, I, I, I know there was some discussion when I was out west about what a gestation um, uh, time would be for an animal of that size, and. Um, it certainly would be more than a human ge- gestation of nine months. So, and and how much offspring do they have? Most of um, suggested um, reports, or there's a video where they only seem to have one um, child or youth. So, again, the answers would be: How often do they mate? When do they mate? How long is the gestation period? Those are things we don't know, and. And one day maybe we will, we can, we can do estimates, estimate, you know, of, yes. of what it might be. Christine, listen, I really enjoyed our conversation. I'd love to have you back uh, in the future yeah. to talk some more about uh, Sasquatch. And uh, just keep in mind that the Ontario uh, Wildlife Field Research Group, we're going to be planning in the future, um, as um, I've attended out west, uh, we're going to take people out um, to a base camp and do some investigating because there's uh, so much interest in in this now. Absolutely. Got to run. But listen, always a, pl- yep. a real pleasure. Thank you, Christine. All right, then. Thank you. Good night. My thanks Bye. to Tim Spreen for production. Is my little Zachary around? He wandered out of the boardroom. He woke up. Uh, but anyway, I thought he might want to say good night. I see his teddy bears over there anyway. Uh, back next week with a brand new show. Hope you'll be along for that. In the meantime, don't be afraid. There's nothing concealed that won't be revealed and nothing hidden that won't be made known. What you hear in the dark, speak in the light. What I say in a whisper, proclaim from the rooftops. Do you want to say good night, Zachary? Come here, quickly, quickly, quickly. Good night. Good night, sweetheart. Richard Serrett's Strange Planet, following the truth wherever it leads. Exposing evil and corruption and the secret machinations of powerful elites. Revealing the high strangeness beneath the surface of our supposed reality. Coming to you from the Great White North and his studio beneath the stairs. Here's Richard. Richard. 
Welcome to the Audio Imaginarium. Great to have you aboard. And uh, I feel like a United Church minister about to officiate at a wedding. Uh, you know when they usually begin with a series of announcements before they begin the, uh, the nuptials? Uh, you know, please, no confetti inside the church. Um, and uh, let's thank all the women in the kitchen for uh, putting out an, such a nice spread and all that sort of Anyway, here are my announcements, and they're important, so have a listen. First of all, uh, Tim Spreen is here. Uh, Albert, the intern, is here. Our uh, HOAs, our, our HOA, our hang, Hangout on Air, is... I'm getting the thumbs up from Albert. We are back up and running this week. Um, and um, at least you can see me in studio. And our special guest host, Richard, uh, and I'll talk about Richard here, the other Richard, in just a moment. If you want to watch the live stream of the program, just go to my Twitter feed, at Richard Serrett. Click on the tweet near the uh, the top uh, of the uh, the feed that says HOA. It's a link there. Just click on it, and you're in. And uh, I just mentioned our guest host, Richard Astley, is uh, here. He's our contest winner. Wave to the good people, Richard. There he is. He is uh, our contest winner from uh, our live stage event uh, back in April, Follow the Truth 2. Richard won a dinner uh, with yours truly, and I don't know if that's much of a prize, (laughs) but he sat through dinner, and uh, uh, here he is in studio. We had a lovely battered fish uh, uh, dinner just down the street at the uh, the local here in Liberty Village. Uh, and also, Richard Astley gets to co-host tonight's program, and he helped put the program together as well. Uh, and he wanted to talk about Bigfoot. And uh, we will, in just a few moments, Dr. Melba Ketchum, one of the lead scientists with the Sasquatch Genome Project, is standing by. I can't wait to get into that. But Richard... Uh, is um, you're an interest in, in an interesting line of work, Richard. First of all, say hello to the uh, the listeners and, and tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, everybody. Um, just want to say Happy Father's Day to my dad. Um, Please, uh, thank you. Yes, I, I I forgot to do that. Oh. Happy Father's Day to everyone out there. Mm. I look forward to talking about Kubrick and uh, Bigfoot as well. All right. So, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I just do a little bit of work in the uh, funeral supply industry out of uh, or the Durham region. Funeral supplies. That's a much needed, it's recession proof. That's it. Yeah, everybody dies, unfortunately. That's one of the facts of life. All right. Interesting line of work. Okay. Now, uh, so w- why the fascination with Bigfoot? Bigfoot came to me out of the blue. I'm a fan of uh, Les Stroud's Survivor Man, and he's a guy that goes out in the middle of wilderness, and he all of a sudden said, hey, I've heard some things, and I want some explanations. All right. Well, uh, I get a lot of emails. People want to know more about, uh, they want more shows on Bigfoot, and we will deliver in just a few moments. Uh, first, uh, one more announcement. I, I want to spend a few moments here uh, also uh, commending a huge supporter of the Conspiracy Show. We are now approaching our sixth year here on Zoomer Radio, our flagship station here in Toronto. Moses Neimer uh, is also the, the driving force and the creator of Idea City. Uh, which takes place every year in Toronto over a three-day period. Uh, I had the honor of, of speaking at Idea City back in 2012. It's billed as Canada's premier meeting of the minds, and it certainly is that. Um, uh, and the mighty Aphrodite and I uh, were able to attend two out of the three days that just wrapped up uh, on, on Friday. In fact, let me tell a tale out of school. We pulled our, our twin boys out of school on the Friday, uh, so they could attend. It, it was just an amazing a lineup of compelling, captivating, and controversial speakers, just pillar to post, just jam-packed, dense uh, with information. And uh, I especially appreciated uh, and enjoyed the climate change skeptics, which is a topic near and dear to my heart. We're not going to delve into that tonight. Uh, we'll save that for another night. But um, uh, anyway, kudos uh, to Moses Neimer and everyone at Idea City for an absolutely amazing uh, three days, and I can't wait for next year, and uh, uh, hopefully you can attend as well. Uh, One more thing before I introduce uh, you uh, to our Bigfoot specialist. We are officially unveiling the Conspiracy Show app tonight. I've been mentioning this to you over the, uh, the last couple of months. It's now available at Google Play. For you Android users and iPhone users can get it through the uh, through iTunes. Uh, it's a free download. Uh, and um, uh, special thanks uh, to Sharon Forster, who designed and developed the app. Albert, of course, uh, t- uh, to you as well, Albert. Well done. 
Uh, this was sort of his, his pet project. And Albert will be monitoring uh, the app tonight for your questions and comments. You can listen to the show, listen to, to past shows, post questions, comments, uh, upload pictures, participate in polls, uh, and much more. It's just like the website, only better. Uh, far more interactive. So now you can take the Conspiracy Show with you wherever you go. That's the Conspiracy Show app, available now, right now, on Google Play and iTunes. And it's absolutely free. Okay. Um, we are uh, we are going to talk Bigfoot uh, for the next 45 minutes. You know, we've had... We've sort of tackled this issue from an all, a lot of different aspects. We've had Bigfoot trackers on. We've had uh, witnesses. We've had uh, uh, field researchers and authors. Um, but now, as I say, a slightly different angle. A doctor of veterinary medicine and the president and director of DNA Diagnostics, Inc., a genetics laboratory geared to state-of-the-art genetic testing to talk about the um, the Sasquatch Genome Project, Dr. Melba Ketchum, has made a DNA analysis of possible Bigfoot hair samples, which was leaked to the public before the publication of peer reviewed uh, her peer reviewed paper. Uh, uh, Dr. Ketchum attended Texas A&M University, where she received her doctorate in veterinary medicine after five years at the university, and she had a um, a veterinary practice until she founded DNA Diagnostics. She's the president and founder, as I mentioned, of DNA Diagnostics. And um, uh, that company, established in 1985, has become a leader in all types of DNA testing, including human and animal forensics, human and animal paternity and parentage testing, disease diagnostics, trait tests, animal and human identity testing, species identification, and sex determination. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Melba Ketchum right here on The Conspiracy Show. Dr. Ketchum, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Very well. And uh, my special co-host tonight, uh, Richard Astley. Say hello uh, as well. Hello, Melba. Hi, how are you? Good. Uh, Dr. Ketchum, uh, let's, uh, this is your first time on the program. I know you have, uh, you have talked uh, far and wide about this. I, I, um, I've listened to you speak to my colleague at Coast to Coast, uh, George Knapp, on the, on the subject, and uh-huh. was fascinated by it. Uh, but for our listeners here, your first time, uh, just yeah. give us a, a little bit of the backstory about um, how the, the Sasquatch Genome Project got started and what your, your uh, objectives were. Well, it, there was no object, objective at first. I didn't believe they existed. Um, so I just kind of backed into this. It wasn't anything intentional. Um, we'd have people send us samples, you know, every year, and we'd just test them for species identity, but we never got anything interesting until, oh, I don't know, eight or nine years ago now, um, whenever I was asked to do some analysis for, um, uh, at that time, Destination Truth, which was a television show on the Sci-Fi Channel. And they would go around getting samples, and they gave us a Bhutan Yeti sample. Now, there wasn't enough DNA for anything conclusive, but we had non-human hair that gave human DNA, and that shouldn't happen. So uh, about that time, uh, North American Bigfoot Search sent some samples in, and some of them were from eyewitness encounters. And we tested them also, and once again, it was non-human hair giving human test results on mitochondrial DNA, and that's the maternal or the mother's lineage. Right, mitochondrial, right. Yes, and uh, that, like I say, human hair is obvious. You can tell it, and this was not. It looked like, you know, kind of like wavy horse mane hair. It was, you know, much more coarse. So the mitochondrial DNA was saying what? It was. It's 100% modern human. Modern human, and the... the um there's but the my, nuclear DNA, the nuclear DNA, which would be the the, the, the was, male, the as father, we progressed into the pro- process. Uh, when we started getting that, we got a lot of unknown sequence, in addition to um, some human sequence. So it was a mixture. We call it a mosaic of human and unknown DNA. Now, as a skeptic, you mentioned initially you did not believe. No. When you started no, getting I, these, I laughed. At, I would just laugh when I'd get these samples. We, we, it was a joke around the lab. And when you started to get these results, mitochondrial DNA showing human? Well, then I got human. curious. I had no idea what I was dealing with, but I got curious because I knew they shouldn't be. And we did a lot of forensic testing, so, you know, we knew how to keep the contamination. You know, you wash the hair thoroughly uh, with chemicals and, um, you know, vortex it at huge thousands of RPMs per minute. 
uh, with this, these little vortexers that you have, and, and uh, you know, it shakes any excessive DNA off other than just what's on the hair. Uh, you know, what is part of the hair, I should say. But when, so, excuse when me, Dr. Go. Ketchum, but when you're receiving samples from third party out in, the, uh, um, out in the field, how then can you assure its, uh, its providence, I guess? Uh, well, the thing is, it doesn't, this is the whole point of DNA testing. You can pull any DNA from anywhere and pretty well identify it unless it's something that hasn't been seen before. That's the whole point of testing it. When, when you do species identification, uh, which is done with the mitochondrial DNA, it tells you what, what the source of the DNA was. But it can't be tainted or manipulated by someone before they bring it to you. Well, the only thing they can do is, is you know, tell me it's a, a cat, and we test it, it turns out to be dog, and we say, no, it's a dog. <laughs> right, right. I and mean, there's, it's going to show what it is regardless of, of what kind of sample or where you get it. I mean, you know, you could you could go anywhere and get any kind of DNA sample and you not even know what it is and, and when you run the species identity test on it, it'll tell you what it came from. Now when you say the mitochondrial... Or it'll tell you if there's more than one species in there too. Right. Now when you say the mitochondrial DNA was clearly 100% human female... Yes. But the nuclear DNA was undetermined? What does that mean yes. exactly? It means that the way you determine things uh, nowadays is there are these huge databases of sequence from people that have sequenced different uh, different DNA from all over the world and all different types of organisms. And you do what's called a blast search where you plug in your sequence and search against all these millions and millions of, of sequences. And it what it matches closest to is what will come up when you search it. And so, you know, normally you'll get hits you know, off of whatever it is or whatever it's closest to. But we were we were <laughs> getting no hits at all. It was completely unknown, which was, you know, blew our minds. <laughs> I can fact, imagine. I, or a, I can't imagine. I outsourced. I didn't believe it. And so, and I knew that, you know, nobody's going to believe one lab. So we assembled 12 different labs, and we sent these samples out as blind studies. They didn't know what they were testing. They thought they were just testing humans. Right. And I even have an email on the website where one of the PhDs wrote me and said, you know, this doesn't match anything. Uh, have you discovered a new species? I have that actually on the website. People can go read the letter. That's SasquatchGenomeProject.org, and we will continue our conversation with a Dr. Melba Ketchum, along with my co-host Richard Astley, right here on The Conspiracy Show. Don't you dare go away. The truth goes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. opposed. Third, it is accepted as self-evident. self-evident. You're listening to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Welcome back. Dr. Melba Ketchum is uh, with us from the Sasquatch Genome Project. SasquatchGenomeProject.org, the website. Let me crib from that website. It has been a long and tedious battle to prove that Sasquatch exists. We've had the proof for eight years now, but building enough data con to convince mainstream science has taken a lot of time. Trying to publish took almost two years. It seems mainstream science just can't seem to tolerate something controversial, especially from a group of primarily forensic scientists and not famous acad um, academicians, or academians, rather, sorry, famous academians, aligned with large universities, even though most of our sequencing and analysis was performed at just such facilities. We encountered the worst scientific bias in the peer review process in recent history. I'm calling it the Galileo effect, she writes. Several journalists wouldn't even read our manuscript when we sent them a pre-submission inquiry. Another one leaked our peer reviews. We were even mocked by one reviewer in his peer review. We finally found a new journal that accepted our paper and had it peer reviewed using blind peer reviews, which we passed. However, we had to acquire this journal when they backed out of publishing our manuscript five minutes before it was go to go live in order to keep our passing peer reviews obtained by this journal. We chose to do this rather than spend another five years just trying to find another journal to publish and hoping that decent, open-minded reviewers would be chosen. 
We renamed the journal as per our agreement, De Novo. The new journal is aimed at offering not only more choices and better service to scientists wanting to submit a manuscript, but also reviewers and editors that will be fair, unlike the treatment we received. Lastly, we have adhered to all of the standards set in the link below for for, um, author-owned journals. And uh, you can click on that link. It's called uh, publicationethics.org. There's a big, long uh, URL there. And again, that can be found on the homepage at sasquatchgenomeproject.org. Uh, Dr. Melba Ketchum uh, is with us. Now, I, I read that, uh, your words, uh, Dr. Ketchum, just to give people a quick uh, sort of understanding uh, of the obstacles uh, that you faced in trying to, uh, to publish these studies and to give to illustrate something that I've long maintained, and that is how politicized the the whole peer review uh, process is. That's considered sort of the gold standard of a study, that it gets published in a peer review, uh, but not necessarily so. So at what point did you decide you had enough information, it was time to go to go public with this? Give us the timeline there. Oh, well, it was probably about four or five years ago now. Um, we had a lot of, we had sequenced a lot of different uh points on the nuclear genome, and we had the mitochondrial, we had whole genomes from the mitochondrial DNA, and we had, you know, tons of samples. We had over 100 samples in the study, and we went to nature with it, because it it is a nature-worthy, I mean, you know, a new species and all, you go to your bigger journals, plus it had to be a multidisciplinary journal, because we used more than just the DNA, we used several different disciplines including electron microscopy, histopathology, and other disciplines in order to to prove our point. Um, Anyway, uh, at first the reception seemed cordial enough, and um, they sent the paper out for peer review. And they turned it down the first time. Reviewer 1 more or less passed it, said he thought there was something there, but it needed corrections. Well, we And I talked to the editor. The editor editor basically told me that, you know, if you do everything, We'll take it back again if you'll do every single thing the peer reviewers ask you to do. Well, the first one liked it. The second one, uh, he didn't read it because he asked for whole mitochondrial genomes, and we already had them in the paper. So he didn't read the paper. Obviously. The third one uh, made a a crack to the effect. uh, Now, his English was not good, but it, it was obvious what he was saying. He says, you mean to tell me... Caucasian woman go run around in woods with unknown hominid and have baby and give there to? I don't think so. Hmm. But that's what <laughs> the that DNA clearly shows. <laughs> and then the fourth one said, I want one, two, three, four, five. So we went back. We did everything Re- reviewer one wanted. Um, we did everything reviewer two wanted, plus uh, you're supposed to answer them. And those peer reviews are on our website, so you can read how ludicrous they are because they've got my answers to it, referring to the different parts of the paper where the the stuff they were requesting was already in the paper, uh, the data and all. Uh, and then the third one, I mean, there wasn't a lot I could say to him because he just said, you know, he just mocked us. Uh, but we tried to address it as, as you know, professionally as possible. And then uh, the fourth one, we went in and we did everything he asked us to do. So basically when, when the reviewers give you a list of things to do and you meet every one of them, generally they publish your paper. But when we and they asked for whole genomes, which we went back and got three of them, not just one. They asked for a whole genome. We did three. Uh, we came back uh, about a year later because it took us that long to to add the genomes and all. Um, and this time they sent them to the same reviewers, which was not very, didn't make me very happy. But um, they did it. And the first one suddenly says he's not qualified to review it, and he'll just accept what everybody else says. The second reviewer still didn't read the paper because he said we had no materials and methods when they were in the supplemental data per the editor that told me to put it there because the paper was so long. Uh, He also kept referring to it as ancient DNA, which it's not ancient DNA. It was fresh-dried DNA or fresh-frozen DNA, whatever the case may have been. So clearly the game is rigged. and uh... Oh, yeah, yeah. And the third one just said he didn't believe it. It had to be contaminated. And the fourth one wouldn't review it again. And so uh, the upshot of this is uh, you finally found uh, a journal willing to publish, but five minutes before it was to go live... Yeah, they they backed out because because they basically said it would kill their journal if they published something like this. So you bought the journal? Yep, And and published. Well, the investor, Wally Herson, bought it. So you published. 
Yes, and, we published with their repeat with the reviews that the journal the other journal got because we didn't want any part of getting the reviews ourselves. We wanted it to be a, a completely unassociated with me or with you know our group of scientists because we wanted it to be fair, and we got that. And as a result, um, you know, Zoo, Zoo Bank actually published our name that we requested, which was Homo sapiens cognatus. That's what you're calling this. Yes. That's what you're calling Sasquatch. That's the scientific it means, name. It means blood relatives because they are they're they're part human. Well, we'll delve into that a little bit. Let me introduce once again my uh, special co-host uh, tonight, Richard Astley. And uh, Richard, take it away. the The floor is yours, sir. I was just wondering. If, um, sorry, let me uh, try that again. Oh, take sorry. two. I was just wondering if um, you, have you ever seen Sasquatch out in the wild or had an encounter at all? Yes, I have. Oh. Multiple times. What was your favorite one, or what was the one that enlightened you the most? Uh, there's a female that I really liked that she she's just very sweet and likes to, you know, we've had some interaction and it's been a lot of fun. At, at what point, um, sorry, at what point in your journey here uh, did you encounter Sasquatch? Approximately two years before the paper published, um, I kept getting calls from people and, and they refer to themselves as habituators. It's people that interact with them. And, you know, when they first started calling, I thought this was crazy. I didn't believe you know what was going on uh, but some ones that live not too far from me kept kept on until i went out with them to an area where uh where they were and i actually saw five the first time that i was out with people i saw one in daylight and then you know i saw five at night i don't know if the one was still one of them so um you know it was a really interesting day and it was mind-blowing to say the least and after that, then I ended up with a, a lease site where they live, and I've had quite a bit of interaction with them. It's been, it, you know, it can be quite entertaining at times. And and what part of the uh, the uh, the country is this again? In Texas. In Texas. Yeah, anywhere where there's heavy forests, there's a lot of them. They live right under our noses, but they're able to conceal very well and. You know, therefore, most people aren't even aware of them, even though they're there. Oh, wait. Before I throw it back over to uh, to Richard Astley, let me uh, let me just follow up here. Uh, give me a, a physical description, height, weight, physical features. Uh, the first one I saw, the full body on, was eight feet tall because we marked it on the tree that he was standing in front of. He was very square built. Um, his face was not haired, but it was at night, so I could just see the moonlight shining on his face. I couldn't make out his features real well, regrettably. But, you know, it was clearly what he was. His shoulders were very broad. Uh, I mean, you know, like a linebacker, except more so. And he probably weighed about five or 600 pounds, if I had to guess. And uh, matted hair, fur, how would no, you describe it? No, no. Neat. Um, some of them are matted, but, you know, most of them take pretty good care of themselves. And you know, they can be very um, well-groomed. How about their teeth? Do they have canines? Yeah, some of them have uh, canines that are a little bit, I want to say fangs, not really quite that bad, but uh, we've got a picture of one on the Sasquatch Genome Project site, and she's got little canines. But her, their teeth are quite similar to ours, actually. And, um, you know, like I say, she's a good representation. Um, they... <laughs> Some of them, though, have hair on their face. Some of them have partial hair, like the patty film. Some of them have no hair on their face. It just depends on the individual. All right, let me uh, uh, hand it over again. They're like again. people. There's a million of them. Seriously, a million of them? Well, I mean, you know, every, figuratively, but there, okay. I'm sure there's hundreds of thousands of them worldwide. That's remarkable. Uh, Richard Astley, over to you again. With the genome you found, is it possible for crossbreeding at all, or was there signs of any crossbreeding at all in the past? They def there's definitely been crossbreeding. It's in the historical record in a large way, uh, especially in Native American and uh, First Nation peoples, where oftentimes their maidens would be stolen uh, by the Sasquatch, and sometimes they would escape and they'd come back with a, a hybrid baby. And in Russia, there's the, the famous uh, story of Zaina and Quit, where uh, it was a female that was captured and, you know, she had offspring uh, from human males. Um, it seems that, you know, they're not, some of them aren't the healthiest, others are. It just kind of depends. I think they're different enough from us that sometimes the 
the offspring are not as don't live as long as they could or you know maybe aren't quite as healthy as as they could be but um others have gone on and had families and lived normal lives and uh, the the hybrid the again the mitochondrial dna showing um, human female yes uh what do you believe then although it's undetermined what are we talking about here in terms of the uh, the, the the male counterpoint the uh, the father is it Cro-Magnon man is it uh, Neanderthal what is it well it, it it didn't appear to be Neanderthal or Denisovan because they you know we didn't get hits with that like we should have uh, if it had been uh, so it's going to be an unknown species for sure um, one that's not been you know sequenced at this point something like Gigantopithecus and, but, you know they're or? getting these all the time I mean there, there's if you read any of the science that comes out over the last, you know, two or three years, there's just like the Denisovan individual out of Russia. Um, that type of hominid actually has unknown DNA that they don't know where it came from. Um, you know, human beings are hybrids of Neanderthal and Denisovan for the most part. Uh, only the uh, African population tends to not be. Um, but the any, the Caucasians have up to you know three or so percent Neanderthal. I mean, really, the Sasquatch are no different than than we are in that they're a hybrid, just like we are. They just have more of an unknown uh, type of of individual in them than they do human. And I think really, uh, it's because the human has been somewhat bred out because of we're the weaker species over the years. Right. Right. And uh, and how far back does this go? Is it 15,000 years? Did I read correctly? Well, it depends on which of the genomes, I mean, which of the, the mitochondrial genomes you're looking at. Uh, we have some as young as 13,000 years. We I think the oldest one was 26,000 years as far as the, um, you know, when that particular um, haplotype came into into existence. And, and how many... Um, how many species or, or subspecies are there uh, of, of Sasquatch uh, based on well, your there's some studies. There's some generalities. I mean, there are some variants, but, you know, look at human beings. We have a lot of variants, too. We have all our different races, and it's kind of the same thing with Sasquatch. I mean, it's like uh, down south, they're, they're called skunk apes, and they're a little bit smaller a lot of times and a little more primitive looking. And, you know, Pacific Northwest, you get some, some really large ones. Of course, I mean, we've got some large ones around here, too, so can't say it completely, but there are different different variants. Okay, and, uh, uh, Melba, we will take a time out. Difference. We'll take a time out. We'll come back and resume our discussion on the Sasquatch Genome Project with Dr. Melba Ketchum, Richard Astley, special guest host in studio. My name is Richard Serrett. Don't go away. As you're staring up at the night sky, ever wonder who's staring back? You're listening to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. And uh, welcome back. The Sasquatch Genome Project, and we've linked up to that website at uh, richardserrett.com. Just uh, scroll down and find our guest who joins us, Dr. Melba Ketchum. Click on uh, her name, and that'll take you right to the Sasquatch Genome Project. And uh, she is the... uh, President and Director of DNA Diagnostics. This is a genetics lab geared to the state-of-the-art to genetic testing. And um, she has made a DNA analysis of possible Bigfoot hair samples. Uh, and this has been published in a peer-reviewed journal. Uh, before I throw it back over to my uh, special guest host, Richard Astley, um, we were talking about uh, numbers of, uh, you know, the different, uh, I guess, species differentiation uh, in, in different parts of uh, the United States. Now, what size, what, what, how many um, adults, Sasquatch adults, would be required for a, for a viable population, a viable breeding population, in your estimation? I think we've, there's thousands of them, so there is a viable ble- breeding population already. Okay, so uh, at, at least we're talking about in the thousands. Uh, oh, huge, yeah, high thousands. I mean, you know, it, I mean, one location alone, uh, just a very small area, I know there were nine, there's 11 at another. I mean, you know, we're talking, you know, there's thousands of them. 
there's no da- they're not endangered. All right. What is the problem with the scientific community to embrace these findings? For example, back in the uh, the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, we didn't have sort of scientific confirmation of the existence of, I, I believe it was the lowland or the mountain gorilla. Uh, this, uh, you know, up until this point was some, you know, legendary fabled creature. Uh, however, when we had that scientific evidence, it was, re, you know, it was embraced and accepted as a self-evident. What is the what is the, the stumbling block here for the scientific community? Why won't they get behind this? I think because there's such a stigma associated with it, with all the hoaxing that's gone on over the years, and the fact that nobody has, has uh, brought forward a viable body. Well, I mean, there's been bodies, but the government has taken them. So um, it's like, oh, well, you know, we can't really see it, touch it, feel it, so we're just, and these people have hoaxed it, so... Everything has to be a hoax about it, and that's just not true. I mean, there's there's literally, I would bet a hundred thousand sightings over the the over North America. I know one organization has over thirty thousand reports that they've cataloged. So you know, I mean, that many people can't be wrong. You mentioned uh, that 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 bodies have been found. That's always yeah, the big... there have been. How and, do we know, you know this? It's been a cover up. It really has. But how, do you have this on good authority? I mean, how do you know? Yeah, I do have it on good authority. Can you expand on that a little bit? Are you able to? Oh, I've talked to a couple of government officials that came clean with me. I can't go any further with their names or anything, but, um, you know, I, <laughs> they have bodies. Uh, do the, One of the, the, um, the, the, the questions that people often ask is, you know, why don't we find more bodies? Uh, well, do because they, they bury, bury their dead. I was going to ask, do they bury their own dead? Yeah, they do. They do. They take care of things, so... Um, you Are they? Know, they they don't want to be found. They don't want to really be bothered with us, and I don't blame them. I mean, actually, they've got a better lifestyle than we do because all they, you know, they they live in a more or less idyllic society in some ways. Um, they don't, you know, have the all the difficulties we do or the stress that we do with our existence. Can they become aggressive? Yes, there are some bad ones. There are some cannibals. Interesting. And you only have to go as far as the missing 411 books to, to read about some of that. And right, right. Okay, let me uh, turn it back over to uh, Richard Astley, my co-host. In addition to the fur samples you've got, have you received other types of samples, and does any one of those stand out in particular as strong proof? I'm having a little trouble hearing you. In addition what to... What about the samples? You, you received fur samples. I was wondering what other types of samples you've received. Oh, other... we received all different kinds of samples. We had saliva, we had hair, we had... Uh, urine, we had, um, we've got bones that we're getting ready to work on now. We've been raising money to, to, uh, have genomes done on, uh, skeletal samples of giants that we, that may or may not be related to Sasquatch as well as some more Sasquatch, uh, remains that we have, you know, alleged Sasquatch remains like from the Zeta and Quip, uh, Russian samples. We have them. We want to get those whole genomes on them and what have you. So we've been working very hard to and diligently to raise enough money to get that done. Uh, and we've we've got a good start, so uh, we're going to get some of these tested. We have red-headed giants, which uh, the Native Americans, the Paiutes, um, there's a difference of opinion whether they're actually Sasquatch or whether the red-headed giants are another tribe of, of Native Americans that are very tall and red-headed. So... Uh, we're hoping to get to the bottom of all this and, and, uh, in the not very distant future. All right, uh, Melba, stay put, and uh, we will reconvene on the other side. Dr. Melba Ketchum, the Sasquatch Genome Project, right here on The Conspiracy Show. My name is Richard Serrett. It's time to redefine reality. This is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. And we are back with Dr. Melba Ketchum, uh, who is with the Sasquatch Genome uh, Project, and she's made a DNA analysis of uh, possible Bigfoot hair samples. I say possible. You would say 100% definite. Correct, Melba? Uh, Yes, actually. um, I'm quite sure what we have there. Um, It's mammalian hair. It's, um, you know, some of our samples came from eyewitness sources. So that adds a lot of credibility. Uh, in, in, are you able to uh, break down the mitochondrial DNA to determine, uh, for example, 
uh, the, the, the race, uh, are we talking about um, uh, Native American? Are we talking about what? Well, it was a combination of a lot of different ones, um, but most of them had origins uh, back in the Middle East um, or Europe. Uh, but, of course, you know, the Middle Eastern types are older as they spread into Europe, so they all have kind of a root race of, of the, the T2s, which are T's and T2s, which were Middle Eastern types. Um, we had, I think, you know, three or four Native American types. We had, um, I think, three black haplogroups, but the rest, and we kind of wondered if maybe since they came from the south of the U.S., if maybe they were a hybrid from potentially uh, slaves that might have uh, escaped into the wilderness and, and were captured by them and, you know, ended up having offspring. Because uh, we don't know when the hybridization occurred on these, obviously. So, um, but... Generally, the Middle East seems to be the most prominent root source of all of these because even the Native American samples came from those at one point. All right. Uh, Richard Astley is just uh, chomping at the uh, uh, the video. I know he has another question here. Um, Les Stroud, he's a a Canadian. He's got a show, Survivor Man, that airs about his uh, exploits of surviving in the wilderness. Uh, He just did a recent series of investigating um, possible sightings, possible evidence of Bigfoot. I'm just wondering if uh, his investigations has made any headway in the Bigfoot culture, or was there anything that he revealed that is now widely known? Good question, Richard. So, are you, are you familiar with the work of, of Survivor Man Les Stroud? I've heard of it, but I don't I don't follow it. Now, uh, let me ask you about the Patterson Gilman film, which is kind of the uh, I call it the Sapruder film of uh, of sort of the Sasquatch uh, uh, the Sasquatch arena. Uh, is that, in your estimation, legitimate, uh, or is it a hoax? I believe it's legitimate for a number of reasons. Uh, one, whenever you look at it closely, you can actually see she's got a muscle hernia on her right thigh, and it moves when she walks, and that is not something that somebody would think to fake. Um, and, there's, I mean, there's a lot of... Her gait is different from a human. There's been some very good work done on analysis of the gait, and it, it, it just can't be reproduced, plus the size on top of it. Um, there's, there's just a lot of different reasons that I believe it's real. Uh, of course, once again, you've got all the conspiracy theories and people that have tried to, you know, say it's a hoax and what have you, but there's a lot of science. Uh, you know, some, there's been some documentaries even that have done some really nice work of, of showing how the locomotion is completely different than, than a person's. As well as, um, you know, you've got um, this muscle hernia that everybody kind of overlooks for the most part. And uh, to me, that was very telling because, you know, that's something that you can see the muscle moving as she walks uh, under there. It's a, where there's a tear in the covering of the muscle and allows it to bulge. It allows it to bulge through. To me, uh, one of the things that's very compelling uh, is it, it, is, it does look very authentic. And if anyone has seen any of those cheesy B movies from that era in the '60s, with the you know the gorilla that escapes oh, yeah, the they circus, didn't have the technology they technology. did not have those kinds of. And and I believe there was a there's a Hollywood special effects uh, designer who just completed a seven year investigation, and he concluded that it is authentic as well. Yes, uh, you know, I, I now I've I've kind of followed that, and you know, I'm in a hundred percent agreement that, you know, I've, and and plus I've I've seen them, and you know, some of them look like that. They have the, you know, the little cheeks showing, but you know, the rest of their face is here, and it's back to the variation with them. Uh, if this is all true, and and uh, you are you know one hundred percent certain, this would would have to constitute one of the greatest scientific discoveries of all time. Well, we think it is, but, you know, like I say, we have so many naysayers and so many haters out there that have, you know, torn things down that I'm to the point that, you know, it just, it is what it is. And and, and so what is the next step then for you? I mean, how, what else needs to be, what I, uh, you know, T's need to be crossed and so forth? What, what, what well, we want to do some more testing on our, on our skeletal samples, on our giants and cone heads and what have you, because, uh, you know, a lot of the, the Bigfoot, have you know the pointed heads um not only that but um we want to to go forward with um you know trying to compare and see you know if there's anything in common there and and plus we've got some more sasquatch samples that i would like to get some 
confirmation genome zone. Um, the more, the better. So you know, we're still we're still in the process. Like I say, we're raising money to to test some samples. We've got about 20 samples, and you know, we've raised enough to test a few. But we want to try to get all of them tested, so we can you know compare everything at once and you know basically kind of get to the bottom of all of it. Uh, would you be adverse uh, to a humane live capture of... Uh, I would be absolutely adverse to it. You would. How would you like to be captured and poked and prodded and stuck and photographed? No. They're people. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, fair, a, a fair point, certainly. Uh, but, but is there not a humane way? No. No. Okay. I mean, I wouldn't want to be darted and studied. Would you? Well, I'm just wondering if it would lead to an acceptance of this reality, uh, then perhaps we could then begin to work on how do we protect these creatures. They really don't need our protection. They're able to avoid us to a very large extent, and, or else we'd already had everything that we need as far as, as you know, body and everything else. Um, so I just, you know, I don't, I'm not too worried about them. I mean, as many crazies as there are out there hunting them now, literally trying to kill a specimen, um, and they're not having success at this point, uh, I'm not too worried about it. I think that, you know, they're, I've seen what they can do. I can see how they can blend in, and, and, you know, you can walk right up to one and not know it's there, practically. It's like a special forces soldier in full camo that knows what they're doing. You can walk right past him and never know he's there. Well, they're the same way. Is this is this something that is developed uh, through through evolution, or do they possess some some particular type of skill? Uh, or? They have abilities I don't understand. Can you give me an example? And I've just seen them go away so quick that you know it's just not normal. Hmm. I mean, they they just they're not they have abilities humans don't. Let's put it that way. Are they so elusive? Get yeah. by with a lot of things that we don't. Yes, so something that's on the order of eight feet tall, five or six hundred pounds, uh, and able to, for the most part, you, you know, um, avoid detection. It, it is remarkable. But they can do it, and I've seen it. And they just—it's it, amazing. It's—it's uh, it's mind blowing. Uh, and so I—that's why I don't worry about them like I used to. Before I knew very much about them, I was constantly worried about and I, and I do want them protected for a number of reasons not only because they're a type of people and we need to leave them alone they're leave they leave us alone let's leave them alone do they leave us alone do we need to be fearful i'm sorry what uh, well you say they leave us alone but do they necessarily i mean do we have anything to be concerned about when we go walking in the woods well i never <laughs> i never encourage anybody to go walking out of the Oh, sorry, Melba, you, you were breaking up there a little bit. Uh, can I get you? Yeah, you were breaking up, too. Okay. Um, as I said, I don't encourage anybody to go walking in the woods by themselves because there's other things besides Sasquatch to worry about. This is true. And all, most of the Sasquatch will never bother you. They'll just avoid you. It's You know, there's certain hot spots where there's been some bad activity, usually up in the mountains and some pretty desolate areas, um, you know, but for the most or, you know, 90% of them are going to leave you alone and stay away from you, and you'll never know it. Uh, you know, the most you'll get just about usually if you do go in the woods is a kind of a creepy feeling that somebody's watching you. We hear a lot about uh, th- th- this tremendous odor uh, associated Well, they with... can they have it and they don't have it. They can control it. I have experienced that. It's a scent gland? No, I don't think it's a scent gland at all. It's something that they can... <sighs> They can change it, though. It's strange. Um, but, you know, they, they do have an odor. Uh, sometimes I think it's because they've physically been in contact with, you know, think it's their hygiene or, the, you know. Other times it's it's kind of interesting whenever you have one that smells more like flowers. So it's, it's not a consistent thing. Um, although I would say the most common smell you get is that of old dead garbage with a little bit of Otis skunk on top of it. <laughs> Lovely. Lovely. Uh, now, has this essentially taken over your uh, taken over your life? I mean, do you have t- time to uh, to run DNA n- diagnostics for other purposes, or uh, have you been well, totally we, consumed by this? Well, we lost a whole lot of business when we did this. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so, you know, we're not as large as we were, thanks to my stupidity in, in going after this. Uh, I didn't realize the repercussions that it would have and the fact that, you know, it would discredit me as a scientist by just doing a legitimate scientific study. Does it, do you um, regret it? Do you regret this? Yeah, I regret it. I didn't, I'd never do it again. I just want to get finished with it. And put it behind you. Uh, is that even possible? I mean, how do you? I don't know if it's possible because the haters just don't give up. But um, you know, it, it's it's uh, it's been a big disappointment. It really has because I thought it was it was so exciting at first that we had found a new species and and one that was actually a, a, a blood relative of that was ex living at the same time we are, and that was huge. And uh, to have it so poorly received and and what have you, and, and to be laughed at by my peers is, has not been fun. And, you know, yeah, I regret it. I was naive. I didn't think that would happen. I thought if you did good science, it would, you know, go smoothly out there. Well, uh, Dr. Ketchum, uh, for what it's worth, I think you're incredibly courageous, and uh, I applaud you, and uh, I wish you great success. Uh, how can we help? Uh, give us an assignment. Well, an assignment would be to help us get these genomes tested, get them all done, because... You know, a lot of people have said, oh, we need a type specimen. They want to go out and kill once they have a type specimen. Well, for instance, if these giant samples we have uh, turn out to be, you know, in line with what we've already got genetically, we have a type specimen, and that will really nail it. And the same with um, the Zyna and Quit. If, you know, if they turn out to truly be Sasquatch and Sasquatch hybrid, then we'll be able to want to... Here are skulls that came from these, and we have a type specimen once again, which, you know, makes it a lot more um, difficult for the scientific community to ignore. All right, so people can go to uh, SasquatchGenomeProject.org, and there is a, uh, a funding tab they can click on and help out? Yes, yes, and, you know, like I say, because we, we also have, like I say, quite a few cone heads from Peru, the elongated skull people. And like I say, we're interested. My original interest in them was because, uh, once again, a lot of the Sasquatch have similar head shape. Right, right. Listen, we're, we're out of time. So um, you know, we've we've got a variety of samples, and you know, we need to see if they're interrelated or not. If nothing else, I think we'll get some very interesting findings. From indeed, these. indeed. Dr. Ketchum, thank you so much. Thank you. SasquatchGenomeProject.org. My website, RichardSerrett.com. Say hello on Twitter at Richard Serrett. And as always, follow the truth. Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Following the truth wherever it leads. Exposing evil and corruption and the secret machinations of powerful elites. Revealing the high strangeness beneath the surface of our supposed reality. Coming to you from the Great White North and his studio beneath the stairs. Here's Richard. And welcome to the Audio Imaginarium. Come on in, weary stranger. Hang your cloak on a peg, grab a stool, and come gather around the fire. There are stories to be told, and you are among friends. Ian Patterson is uh, here to explain how black ops, aliens, spirits, Bigfoot are all connected. Our untold history. That's coming up in just a few moments. First, let me wish you all a very merry, a very blessed Christmas. Kala Christuyana. And, of course, a happy Hanukkah. Just a programming note. Next week on the program, Jonathan Kahn will be here, my guest. Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, of course, the author of uh, The Harbinger, which caused quite a stir, The Mystery of the Shemitah, and his new book is called The Book of Mysteries. He'll be here to talk about that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, let me welcome a new affiliate aboard. We are very thankful and happy to welcome KMAJ1440, the big talker in Topeka, Kansas. Welcome aboard and thank you. KMAJ for making The Conspiracy Show part of your radio family. Uh, let me quickly introduce the boys in the band on the other side of the glass on the Gibson Flying V guitar, Ian Robertson, who's off uh, getting a pizza <laughs> at the uh, front door. We, we're going to have a little pizza party here tonight. Uh, and here in studio with me, my story producer on the Rickenbacker bass guitar and occasionally the theremin 
Albert Vinzel, who also doubles as our um, resident remote viewer. And uh, just very quickly, uh, this is our, our regular segment. This will be our last What's in the Box for 2016. Uh, Albert, our remote viewer, what do you think is in that box? Have you thought about it? Have you had time to contemplate, to well, transcend space and time, my friend? Well, I think it may be a coin, like I get a metallic sound or a bell ringing. Metallic? All right, listen, we're gonna, I'm not going to reveal it till the bottom of the hour. Work on that a little bit. Metallic? That's good. You're not there, though. Keep working, keep utilizing the remote viewing protocols. And for those of you listening uh, at home, if you want to uh, to try and utilize your own remote viewing skills, uh, you can send me a tweet with your guess. Use the hashtag TCS, TCS, as in the conspiracy show, TCS Remote. Is that right, Albert? Is that yeah. the, the hashtag? Yeah. Hashtag TCS Remote. And uh, let me know what's in the box. All right. Uh, around the age of 23, so we're going back now into the early 90s, uh, my next guest was introduced to a UK Royal Air Force a person who claimed he knew about aliens. And uh, so my guest wanted to, to film this person for a documentary about aliens uh, at some later date. So he met the person. They spent about three hours talking in a, in a car park. And uh, this individual with the uh, the RAF, uh, talked about dimensions and orbs and, and so much more. And so my guest started to doubt the man as uh, he'd never even heard of orbs. And so he never got to film this uh, individual as he was called away on duty. However, uh, a few years later, 1998 now, my guest's father passed away and he helped his mother use a homemade Ouija board. At this point, he didn't uh, believe in spirits, but after asking the Ouija board some questions... Uh, the glass started to move, or the, the planchet started to move around on the board, and it, it was giving the correct answers. And then he had no doubt that there was a spirit world. Over the following years, he began researching what he could find about aliens, and he heard eyewitnesses claim the same things that the, the uh, RAF individual did all those years before. And this made him a believer. So, about three years ago, he started looking for books that connected everything, but there weren't any. And so, he thought it was time to write one. And now we have Black Ops, Aliens, Spirits, Bigfoot, and Our Untold History. Ian Patterson was born and raised in London, London, England. From an early age, he was fascinated by TV programs with aliens in them, and he remembers his mother reading an article from a newspaper about a man who went into his back garden and vanished, never to be seen again. Of course, this sparked his interest in the paranormal. His work today is mainly in directing and writing low-budget films, documentaries, and computer special effects. Ian Patterson, welcome to The Conspiracy Show. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm very well, and I understand it's very early in London. It's about 4 o'clock in the morning, I think, give or take. So thank you for, for uh, getting up early or staying up late, whatever the case may be. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. So this is uh, quite an undertaking. Um, uh, Black Ops, Aliens, Spirits, Bigfoot, and Our Untold History. And uh, you, you discuss alien races, the Anunnaki, bloodlines, ghosts, spirits, souls, dinosaurs, cattle mutilation, so much more. And uh, the sort of the thesis is that all of these uh, things are in some way connected. So yeah. uh, let's start. Well, where else are we going to start? We're going to start at the beginning. And um, when we look at Genesis, for example, that's probably the best place to start because, um, well, you, you you tell us sort of what your years of research have led you to believe about we have sort of the, the, the biblical creation story and how that connects ultimately to everything else. Let's, you know, E.T., for example. Okay. Um, well, sort of a, a rough example would be um, the Anunnaki, as it says in the Book of Enoch, the Anunnaki, just over 2,000 years ago, set off a nuclear explosion. Um, so I needed to see whether that that there was any correlation between uh, the Book of Enoch, the Bible, and any scientific proof. Um, the scientific proof comes in the form of a radiation belt about 7,000 miles ar around the area that the Book of Enoch says that there was a nuclear explosion. 
And when I looked into the Bible, we could see that the Bible would actually say that um, the... Sorry, I'm slightly nervous. The uh, explosion caused um, the... I've actually got it written down here, if that's okay. Um, in Zechariah, the, this shall be the plague which the Lord will strike all the peoples down, um, which would be the nuclear explosion. Right, right. Um, their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouth. Uh, and many people died from water because it was bitter. So that put the connection between... Uh, all three of those, the Book of Enoch, the real proof that... The, and there was even uh, green glass found in the desert. So, in 1950, I think it was. Right. So, uh, I think um, it was at the Gobi Desert in India or somewhere near Pakistan, and this this sand was fused, and they and it has been suggested that this was evidence of a, an ancient nuclear b- blast, and, and uh, the Vedic writings uh, also make reference to... Some sort of what sounds very much like a nuclear war. Uh, Robert Oppenheimer, uh, of course, the father of of the nuclear uh, bomb, once commented when he was asked uh, after the the test uh, explosion at Trinity whether this was the first use of a nuclear bomb, and he said yes. And then he said, "In modern times," mm. which is very interesting. I, I think I also read somewhere that um, Einstein um, t- commented on the green glass as well. Hmm, I didn't know that. That's interesting. I remember that from way back. That's another thing that sort of, over, over the years, little things keep piquing my interest, which kept me going and going and going. And I think that was one of them. So, again, the, the timing of this ancient nuclear blast was, was how long ago? Um, just over 2,000 years. 2000, uh, the dates are slightly, you know, within 100 or so years, but it's about 2,100, 2,200 years ago. Well, that is, uh, that would be... Just the... before Jesus... Okay, before the birth of Christ. Okay, so yeah, the, all right. The, now the um, the the book of Enoch it talks specifically about. Does it mention the Anunnaki by name? No, it doesn't. Uh, well, it, there's a few different translations of the Anunnaki. Um, some people call them the princely seeds. Um, others call them those from heaven came to earth, and slightly vari- variations of that. The I mean, my interpretation of, of um, the Anunnaki is that their actual name isn't the Anunnaki because no race would call themselves princely seeds and no race would call themselves those who heaven came to earth. Um, the the only word that kept, keeps coming up over and over again is Elohim. That's the only... I mean, everything else they, they talk about, you know, Enoch and Enki and Anu and what they have for breakfast and all, they actually really do cover everything and the only thing they don't actually talk about is the the race name which um they have actually got Alahim all over the place so that makes me believe that the their actual real race name is is Elohim right because is Elohim is, is is a Hebrew word but it is it's sort of plural but it's also um yeah, it kind of breaks the rules of grammar because it can be used also as a singular, meaning a g- God, but also gods. Now, Christians would look at Elohim and they would say that in the Old Testament, uh, that is almost a, it's the the Trinity is contained within the word Elohim because they're really hinting at the Trinity, even though it's the Old Testament. But you're saying the Elohim in this case, the gods are referring to the Anunnaki, which is I guess that would be the Sumerian word for these. Uh, these, these yeah. yeah, these entities. Yeah. Okay, so um, can, we were talking. So we were talking about uh, the book of Enoch and the um, the idea that and the Sumerian creation legend, uh, Sumer, uh, that the the human race was kind of a. A, a, a hybrid experiment, right? It was they um, they created they created man from modern man, I guess, from the primitive inhabitants of the earth, and they did a little DNA splicing with the Anunnaki. Is that is that? Do I have the gist of it? Yeah, that's that's um, one of the sort of telltale factors is in the Book of Enoch. One of the I think it's. Um, Enki goes off to Africa, um, and Africa is the the modern place that we all agree that 
where the first sort of human originated from. So when I talk to people and they say, oh, yes, but you're saying Mesopotamia and Sumeria, how can you justify the fact that modern science is now saying that it's coming from um, Africa? But we can actually say it's coming from Africa because in the Book of Enoch it says that uh, Enki goes off to Af Africa and that's where he creates modern man. So it all ties in still. All right, let me just uh, jump in here. We've got a break coming up. Ian Patterson, my guest, live on the line from London, England. Black Ops, Alien Spirits, Bigfoot, and our untold history. Everything is connected. Back with more in a moment here on The Conspiracy Show. Stay with us. The truth goes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Ridicule. Second, it is violently opposed. Opposed. Third, it is accepted as self-evident. Self-evident. You're listening to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Welcome back. Just a reminder: we will reveal the contents of our um, our humidor, <laughs> the uh, "What's in the Box" segment. And again, use the hashtag TCS Remote. TCS Remote. Uh, Ian Patterson is with us from London, England. Black Ops, Alien Spirits, Bigfoot, and our untold history. Uh, by the way, Ian, how, how can people get a copy of the book? Um, it's available on Amazon and Amazon Kindle and Amazon Kindle Unlimited. All right. Um, you, you mentioned the uh, evidence of a, uh, a nuclear explosion uh, some 2,100 years ago. And um, there seems to be evidence of uh, cosmic wars that go back even further. Uh, we had John Brandenburg on the program, I guess, a couple weeks ago, and he, he was talking about evidence for a nuclear blast on Mars. Uh, this would have been millions of years ago that, that um, he's a, he says the signature is unmistakable. There's no other way the, uh, the radiation signature could get there. It's not a comet impact. It had to be a nuclear blast. Uh, and he said, this is what destroyed the atmosphere and the ancient civilization on Mars. What do you think about that? Um, yeah, I looked into that myself. Um, there's a few people that, uh, some people say that the indigenous people to Mars actually destroyed themselves. And then there's other people that say that another race, a third race, came along and destroyed them also. It, it's really, really tricky because, as you know, the only sort of real people that would know the answer to exactly what's happened on would be NASA. I think, um, and they don't actually, they won't give out any information on r rock sam samples, etc. Which are also slightly dubious whether actually some of the rovers are actually really on Mars or whether they're actually on a, a remote island that NASA uses here on on the UK uh, in the on Earth. Right. So I, to, to answer your question, I don't know for sure. It's really difficult because I don't. It's something you can't sort of check up on. Hundred and ten percent. You know, you just can't get that information. Right. I mean, now, the yeah. the <laughs> um, the Anunnaki, uh, their home planet Nibiru, uh, sometimes referred to as, as Planet X, and uh, there is a. Um, I guess we first started hearing about Nibiru coming around. Well, we heard about it from obviously from Zachariah Sitchin, um, but there's recently been a, a woman claiming to be an e ET contactee. Um, whose name escapes me, Nancy... Uh, it's uh, Lee, Myers, Lee, Lee or Myers. Uh, leader, something like that. Leader, yes. leader that's it, yeah. And she, she believes that uh, Nibiru is headed back this way. This is, again, the, the home planet of the Anunnaki. Um, in fact, some claim that uh, Nibiru is, is set to swing by the Earth, which would cause a cataclysmic event. Uh, wouldn't necessarily have to collide with the Earth, but just passing, you know, within the within the vicinity would cause, you know, massive tsunamis and earthquakes, and it would be a planet killer essentially. Uh, she says it, uh, or it has been reported by some that this planet is supposed to swing by um, even before the end of this year. Any thoughts on on Nibiru coming back? Um, yeah, I mean, I cover it a bit in the book. The the Na Nancy story version. I think there was. Um, reports that she'd said that it was due back um, at least about ten, 10 years ago, um, but it never actually came back. So then people started to doubt her, but she, her version is that she got the information from uh, the Zetas. Um, the, the, or the, I, I believe there's two different types of well, there's a few different types of grades, but the, there's the Orions and then there's the Zetas. And she's saying that she got the information from the Zetas. 
my argument to help her would be that these eaters probably don't know our exact time frame. You know, to them, one day is probably you know, a, a week, for example, same as Nibiru would take um, a lot longer to, t- to go around the Earth or go around the Sun, which makes their year a lot longer than ours. So it's possible that the information that she was given could actually be still true, but she may have got the wrong dates just be- because they said X amount of time as would pass. So, yes, it's... It, um, frighteningly I do believe there is probably another planet out there there's a few planets that NASA each each year keep talking about saying that there's new planets that they found that have elliptical orbits which would be the same as Nibiru they're not saying that that's Nibiru but they are saying there's planets out um, outside our solar system and even on the far reaches of our solar system that have um, an elliptical orbit so if they're they're actually admitting that the planets can have you know, 12,000 year elliptical orbit, then it's possible that there was a, a 36,000 year planet coming back, uh, which kind of frightens me a bit. Hey, this is what's, yeah, Sitchin wrote a book about this. I think it was called The Twelfth Planet. Uh, some call it Nibiru. And uh, so the, the orbit, this elliptical orbit, did you say it's, is it 36,000 years? It, it's supposed to swing by, or is it 3,600 years? Uh, sorry, it's the English to the American. Uh, 3,000. 600 years. Yeah, 3,600 years. So, I mean, if, yeah. you, if, you, if you line that up, this orbit, uh, and every time it swings by, it causes some massive cataclysmic event. Um, I mean, some have, some have suggested that it, does, it lines up with things like the Great Flood, uh, you know, the global flood that in, in the Genesis account. Uh, it lines up with uh, the coming ice ages and so forth. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um... Th- I mean, some people say that the 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 time frame for the three thousand six hundred years is um, not accurate. There's different times, so then when they go back, there's different um, different events happen. So, it, but yeah, as a general rule, I do believe that the the flooding um, coincides with with Nibiru coming back. The problem with that is then you've got to think, well, if if the Anunnaki are on Nibiru and they're aware of the planet coming back round, then, you know, are we the ones that get the brunt of, because they're planet, I think, apparently about four times the size of Earth, are we the only ones that really get a problem with that? Um, and then when you look into the, sort of the secret space program, there's a couple of um, suggestions that uh, the uh, secret space program have got these spaceships that are actually trying to push Nibiru out of the way to stop us from getting the same sort of catastrophes that's happened in the past. Again, the problem with that is if there really isn't um, Anunnaki on Nibiru, they really wouldn't want to be pushed out of the way um, by you know, humans trying to move their planet out of uh, their orbit. Um, and then you've also got the other option that it could be um, Nibiru could be similar to the moon, um, a spaceship, but the argument then would be they wouldn't want to come back round and they could just park it. There's no reason for them to want to have to keep going round and round. Right. Now, when the Anunnaki uh, first came to Earth, uh, I mean, how long did they did they stick around? And what was the purpose? Why did they come? Um, I mean, I can only go by, by uh, Zachariah Sitchin's work, um, which basically says that they, they required some sort of gold powder to possibly sprinkle over their atmosphere to protect their own atmosphere um they it looks like they stayed for at least um 300,000 years which to us seems a long time but for them if their their one year is 3,600 um then it's not very long for them at all so you'd think well why have they stay this long but it's not that long for them so i think they they stayed that amount of time and then when obviously they was creating the first humans which adam i think is in Hebrew, is, is translates to human. So when they created the first human, um, that took them thousands and thousands of years to actually get that right, which is why it's, um, they use the, the humans to to mine for this gold, which is why we now believe gold is precious, whereas years ago, when before anyone worked out gold was precious, someone had to, this is the sort of the way my thinking is, someone had to say to our ancestors, hey, gold's precious. 
because we wouldn't have melted it at the heats that, that you would need to melt gold and things like that back then, you know, 10,000 years ago uh, or, or less. So the so I do believe that, that uh, you know, the Anunnaki did require gold and fashioned gold into various objects, um, which the, we later on perceived as precious. And then we started to um, look at gold in that way as well. So they created essentially a slave race uh, using primitive man uh, with, um, I guess, some, some, some DNA from their own species. Is that the idea? Yeah, the, um, there, there was a few different types of um, humanoid creatures or, or humanoid people on this planet at the time. And they, I'm not sure which ones they actually done the DNA on. But um, the story goes, as in the Bible, they, they, uh, they took Adam's rib and created Eve. Um, if you look at, um, ask any doctor, which is the best place to get you know, the, the, the DNA or the bone marrow, etc., etc. They say the rib because it's less intuitive and it's the best place to get it. So if you take the Bible literally, then they did create Eve. The problem then is um, Adam and Eve had three sons um, who then had their children, but it doesn't actually say who who they had relationships with. The only woman that, that, that seems to be around is Eve. So it looks like they had relationships with their own mother um unless the, you know everyone didn't bother you know the bibles etc didn't bother adding the fact that there was extra women coming along but also if you look at the nature of the anunnaki and and the following pharaohs they all inbred anyway to keep their, their true bloodline so it's possible that the um anunnaki didn't mind um adam and eve's offspring procreating with their mother because that's the way they do it they they all seem to keep everything inbred right well there is of course the um, uh, the mention of the fallen angels uh in uh, genesis and i i believe that they're also mentioned in enoch uh where these fallen angels uh, commingle with the daughters of men meaning women and create this race called the nephilim now for, for from the christian perspective i suppose the the idea is that these are fallen angels these are uh, you know, Lucifer and his minions, those angels that stood in opposition or rebelled against God. Um, so in your interpretation, then, the uh, the Nephilim would have been the product of the Anunnaki, um, I guess, and their hybridization program with humans. Um, well, the, uh, the way I see it is the, the eight for Anunnaki had relationships with the human women, which then produced giants, which were called the Nephilim. Right. That's... And they talk about, uh, you know, that in the Bible they mention that the Nephilim would be would be the men of renown. Uh, so like the Titans and, and uh, I suppose then the, the gods of the various uh, pantheons around the world, the Egyptian pantheon, the ba- Babylonian pantheon of gods, the Greek pantheon of gods. Uh, Zeus, Poseidon, etc. Correct? Uh, not the way I saw it. No, no. I, okay. I, no um, I just think that the the Nephilim were literally just giants which um, had cannibalistic traits, um, and they, they, after a while, the the king Anu didn't want the true bloodline again going back to their true bloodline, didn't want their true bloodline tainted with um, half breeds, so they wanted to wipe them out, which gives them the reason to either allow the flood to happen, knowing that the planet's back coming back round, or they deliberately wiped us out, or wiped them out some other way. The Zeus and um, Neptune and, and those type, I believe, are just simple anarchy um, that were perceived as they went around different places. I mean, if, if you, again, believe that the, the, the one year is 3,600 of our years, then they could have travelled all over the planet, and you know, in such a long life, lifetime. Which is why, when um, the Adam and Eve had longer lifespans, because they used the Anunnaki's part of Adam and the Anunnaki's DNA, which 
made, I'm even going back down to Noah, was said to have lived for a few hundred years. Yeah, 600 years, Methuselah, of course. Mm. Yes. Um, so then, in, in other words, the, the, the Greek gods, uh, the Egyptian gods, etc., that would have been either, en- they were just, like Zeus, for example, would have been Enlil or Enki. They're just known yeah. by different names according to the different cultures. Precisely, yeah. I, I, I actually believe the pharaohs were sort of lesser um, Ananarchies because they weren't uh, they weren't classed as gods. So uh, sort of demigods, more like yeah, demigods, so to speak. Yeah. So th- there was a different name for them. Um, and then you got Abraham, which was one of the descendants further down from. Um, Adam and Eve, who I think was the first person to create the first religion. I think it was a Jewish religion, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and the way I see that is that um, he was allowed some power, but but wasn't allowed total power. So the Anunnaki allowed some of the sort of offspring or hybrids, should I say, um, certain powers. And once they got to Abraham, he wanted more powers. And the only way he could see this is just my interpretation of it. Well, the only way he could see people following him would be if, obviously he's not a god, is if he created some sort of way for people to follow him just as people followed, you know, the Anunnaki. So he created the first religion, and then obviously people after that could say, hang on a minute, if he's got, <laughs> got loads of people following him, I'll create a religion, and that's how I believe all the religions uh, got created. All right, we will uh, take a time out, and uh, on the other side, continue to delve into Black Ops, Aliens, Spirits, Bigfoot, and our untold history with Ian Patterson, right here on The Conspiracy Show. Don't go away. It's time to redefine reality. This is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. All right, welcome back to the program. Before we get back to Ian Patterson and our untold history, let's just uh, reveal what's in the box. Before that, though, Albert, what is uh, what are people uh, tweeting here? All right, Amanda Curran says, a purple My Little Pony. Uh, <laughs> Jackson says, a pizza cutter. Uh, some, Luke Parkhill says, a candy cane. And David LaSalle says a snow globe with a house and a snowman. Ah, oh, they're all going very seasonal. And uh, you said something metallic. Albert, you were the closest. A spoon? Three spoons? Well, let's uh, open it up and find okay, out. Hold on, I've got to set to the webcam from Twitter. All right. I'll tell you, um, you were you were close with uh, metallic. I think if you'd spent a little more time, you may have uh, nailed it. There you go. <laughs> a flashlight. It is a flashlight. All right. All right, we'll we'll uh, we'll continue along with uh, our conversation with Ian Patterson. Now, uh, Ian, we were talking about uh, the connection between the Anunnaki and the um, the Egyptian pharaohs and so forth. Uh, what is the, then the purpose of the uh, the pyramids? First of all, who built them and what for? Okay, uh, this is again just my interpretation. All the pyramids are different, and they're all they're all created differently for different reasons. I think that, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, there was one recently uh, found in Mexico. I think it was. Yeah, they're, they're, these um, things that, are all over the world. They, I think, yeah. they uncovered some in Serbia. They're, they've been found in in, um, in Thailand. Italy even, uh, yeah. But the one the one I'm talking about actually had um, they found mercury, flowing mercury underneath it. Uh, when you look into what mercury can be used for, it can actually be used for um, weeding out the the gold in ore. So if you think if you think that the Anunnaki were actually um, mining gold, then mercury would be the perfect use to to extract the the gold. Um, the Great Pyramid, um, after after doing as much research as I can, the only sort of logical answer to that would be that the that is actually built as a power plant uh, i have i've read other theories about that that the that the the uh, the pyramids were essentially some sort of a like a giant capacitor or something um fascinating and but you're saying some of the other pyramids were being used in the in the mining of gold yeah and just different for different reasons yeah um, there's no reason for them to have built three pyramids right next door to each other, all for power, on, on the Giza plateau. Uh, so one of those was for the, the largest one, I believe, was for power. I'm not sure what the other two are for, uh, were built for, but I don't actually believe the 
the dates of the pyramids either. Um, the Great Pyramid, the only reference was a, to who it belonged to um, was, I don't you know, you're probably aware of this, but the graffiti that was written, um, and a few people tried out to actually scrape, recently tried to scrape um, paint samples off to, to get it you know, sort of carbon dated. But if the dates are incorrect, then the pyramids go back way more, you know, at least another 5,000 years before that. Of course, then you've got people saying that, ah, oh, well, the pyramids match. If you go back to the star dates, the, the King's Chamber shafts match Orion's belt and the constellation. But the problem with that is recently, if you know the Discovery Channel, they've actually gone in and, and sent a, a robot up through one of the or through both of the shafts and they both turn uh i think it's something like nearly 90 degree angle which then means that the shafts don't actually go off to the a match orion anymore because if they're, if they're going off at a different angle then then you can't you know uh, the problem is some people try to associate things that we know with certain things and obviously if the shafts were going up that was great but if they're now changed then they're used for a different reason. They're not to point to the stars. And obviously they're not used for um, the spirit of, um, a, uh, you know, a dead pharaoh because, A, they weren't used as tombs, and, B, why would he need two shafts going up? Um, the same sort of thing with um, crop circles. People believe that the crop circles are messages for us. They actually predate the first... I mean, you need to be at least, you know, nearly a thousand feet up in the air to be able to see some of these crop circles and they predate the first flying machine which would have, would have been the hot air balloon so they're not actually made for us and if they were made for us they would have been a lot smaller for us to be able to see ah uh, excellent so point we... excellent point so what are they sort of like signposts for for ets flying by the the crop circles i believe are were actually um the state of the planet the the orbs which from what I gather from the the bloke that I met 20 odd years ago, when he was the way he was talking, it seemed to me that the orbs, which are an energy force, which we can't actually see, he said that sometimes people see them out of the corner of their eye, and that's because they're at a slightly different sort of frequency to us. And I guess the, the best way to describe the orbs would be if you've got a remote control, if you point that remote control um, and look at the, the top of it, the LED, the little light infrared you can't see anything but if you put a camera and you film that you press the button that light's flickering away and yet we can't see it so the same goes for the the orbs they're, they're there but we can't actually see them so when they need to mm, sort of manifest something to do with with earth they have to sort of change their frequency in which case we can then see them which is why a few people have filmed them and a few people have seen them so i believe that they actually go into the earth see what's happening with the earth Come back up, create the symbol or the you know, information that possibly another race above that's not them, not the orbs, um, would then use that information to determine the state of the planet. And that's the crop circle, and that actually uh, kind of connects with, a lot with uh, what Patty Greer has said in this program, uh, the crop circle gal. We'll uh, continue this conversation. Ian Patterson, Black Ops, Alien Spirits, Bigfoot, and our untold history. He connects them all, folks. Stay tuned. As you're staring up at the night sky, ever wonder who's staring back? You're listening to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Welcome back. Ian Patterson stays with us. Black Ops, Alien Spirits, Bigfoot, and our untold history. He connects all the dots. Alien races, Anunnaki, bloodlines, ghosts, spirits, souls, dinosaurs, cattle mutilation, so much more. Uh, let's uh, actually focus on uh, bloodlines because we were talking about the, uh, or you mentioned the Anunnaki, uh, who were on this planet for several hundred thousands of years. And... Um, the, if we trace the bloodlines of certain dynasties, let's say, uh, well, there's this whole thing about the RH factor. And I've had Nick Redfern on the program. He, he wrote a book called Bloodline of the Gods. And uh, he notes that it's very interesting. Uh, you would think that if, in fact, for those who believe in, in evolution that we evolved from monkeys, uh, that we should all have this RH blood marker. 
Uh, but there's a certain percentage of the population, which I think it's around 5%, that does not have the RH blood marker, which is a protein, uh, which would then what suggests that those without the RH factor somehow uh, carry the the bloodline of the Anunnaki. Does that make sense, Ian? Yeah, yeah. Um, the the negative part of the RH can actually kill unborn babies, which is kind of you know if you go along the evolution line, it's something that's quite quite rare. Is uh, can't um, can't think of anything that would you know dis- dis- sort of destroy uh, an unborn uh, baby. So you have to then sort of think, well, okay, where why is this? You know, is this an anomaly or is this something that was actually inherent? due back to some, some other reason. So if you look at the Anunnaki and the, the, the type of person they were, um, you know, some people say that they were redhead, some people say that they were all white, with big white beards and white hair, which then you could say, okay, well, that explains why people call God, um, you know, with a big white hair and big white beard. Um, but are they, were they albino? Um, and then you've got to think, well, okay, if they're albino, were they albino because their planet goes so far away from the sun, in which case they don't actually get the heat that we would get from the sun. And, and then, so you then work out why, you know, what kind of blood they would have if they were further away. Would their, would their planet be the, the, the thing that actually heats them up? Because if they go so far away, and NASA um, has admitted that certain planets can actually, just from their own core, keep, keep the planet warm. So they don't have to be that close to the sun. So by adding everything together, you can sort of say, okay, well, their blood might be slightly different to ours, and what what would it be different, and would that have trans, transferred over to a sort of a bloodline? Uh, we can't, unfortunately, go back to Adam and Eve and find out whether they were the ones that had the first sort of negative version of the RH. But yeah, it does it does make you think. I mean, I've put it in the book, but as you say, there's, there's other people who's also looked into this. Um, it just doesn't make sense that you know something can kill babies. It just uh, I don't know if you know what I mean. It's just right. And and why would only a certain percentage of the population be missing the RH factor? And um, I've heard tell that. The uh, there's a one of the commonalities among people that have been abducted or claim to be have been abducted is again that missing RH. Yeah, um, some of the some of the reasons why I believe that people were abducted um, at certain times anyway are they come back with radiation burns, small radiation marks, and if you go along the theory that some of the um, alien races out there actually have problems with the radiation, space radiation, then it would make sense that they were trying to find a cure either for them or for us or for our hybrids between <laughs> human and uh, grey gray aliens. So if if they've got um, reasons to want to take people with RH negative to test, then you think, well, okay, are they, do they know of the Anunnaki? Why, why weren't they doing it with the Anunnaki? Why, why don't they just ask the Anunnaki to use their RH negative instead of taking us. Does that make sense? It uh, sort of. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it if, does in a way. If we've got their part of their blood. What you know? Would they have used the Anunnaki, or the Anunnaki would have said, "No, go away. We, we don't want anything to do with you." In which case, that would explain why they use us right. instead of going to them. Right. Um, We've only got about seven, eight minutes here, so you know we have to sort of j- jump ahead. And I know that it's when people buy this book, it's important they sort of go chapter by chapter because you have to you sort of build one layer upon the next. Um, but I do want to jump ahead to another paranormal uh, phenomena that you say sort of ties into all of this. Again, there is sort of one unifying um, thing that connects all of these things: aliens, ghosts. Even Bigfoot, but let's talk about you. You touched on orbs re- uh, um, recently, but let's talk about ghosts and spirits and so forth. How does that connect in with what what we're talking about here? Um, the, the I mean, it all started from the guy that I was talking to. He he started talking about the orbs, and then he started talking about spirits, etc. And you know, at that time, I, I thought that was silly. But as you go along, you realise. Well, I I believe that the the orbs are sort of the master, not the master race, but the, the, the main 
entity that's around, and they can split off into um, smaller sort of um, entities, which then um, join with humans before they're born into the pineal gland, and then they stay with the humans. They learn what the humans learn, and then they when they when the human dies, they they leave which uh, they leave the body and then become ghosts. And they can even now go back to their collective, or they can stay as a ghost um, until it's time for them to pass over. So sometimes you hear mediums call out for someone and say, "Oh, you know, I'm looking for Fred," and they get another spirit through, and they say, "No, Fred has already crossed over." Which is weird because we say when when someone dies they cross over, but the spirits then say that they cross over. So once they cross over, they're back to the sort of their collective. So the orbs are, from what I gather, are the the main entity, and the um, zetas, not not so much the zetas, but certainly the Orion greys, are actually working with the um, the orbs. I mean, there's so many stories of, of um, the orbs being seen with the greys, uh, being harvested by the greys, even even bodies, you know, people being massaged, uh, the, the greys sort of come out of them. So we're, uh, I'm just trying to do it in this very short space of time. It's quite com- complicated. It is but difficult. The, Let- yeah, the the idea is that the we are just containers, as as many um, abductees have said that the aliens call us. So we're just a vessel. Um, and the certain types of aliens that work with the orbs want to get something from us. So before we actually um, join, before the orb joins with us, they agree in a council and with, with the alien race that they're, they're also working with that we're allowed to be abducted and that this is what we're, they want from us, from you know, from the person that will end up growing up. They want to learn x y and z from them so when we when we have spirit communication ian uh you you talked about using a spirit board or a ouija board when people are having a a spirit communication uh and they believe they're communicating with let's say a dead relative that is a um one of these entities like a light being at this orb that at at one point had sort of grafted on to a human a human and so it retains the memory of that person, yeah. but it's not actually that person, correct? I think it's it sort of like a symbiotic relationship. They are, they are one of the same. The thing is, once the once the spirit the ghost crosses back over to their own plane, you know, the, the original plane that they come from, they I think they lose they keep the, the memories, but I think they lose the personality. So when it comes, because otherwise, the, the whole point is that the the orbs are trying to learn to ascend themselves, um, and they want to learn, you know, good, bad, indifferent. But if they all, if they kept our human traits when they went back to their side, they would they would be fighting each other, to be honest. Right, right. Um, so I don't, you know, too much of a good thing. So I think that that's, I think they are sort of neutral, and they want to experience everything to be able to move up. Otherwise, if they if they've all got their own personalities, these orbs. Then there's no point. They'd, they'd know what it's like to be a human because they would, you know, be fighting. And does that makes sense. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Um, just last point because, and we're almost out of time here. Uh, I, I mean, I'd love to hear how Bigfoot's uh, how Bigfoot fits into all of this. Um, briefly, then, um, they're the way I see it is that they originally are a, an alien race. Um, a few thousand years ago. The, there was a prison ship that crashed onto Earth. Those ones, the, the Bigfoot, stayed here. There was a landmass that could actually join back then. There was, you know, you'd be able to cross one continent to another, right. which is why they, they're in different places, uh, except for England, for example, even though some people say they've seen them. There's none. Um, but the, the, they stayed here for, you know, and they had children, they had children, children. And, uh, you know, way back they used to kidnap people, but, because we've now got guns, they're not daft. These are intelligent creatures. They know that, you know, if they start hunting humans again like they used to, we, we've got guns, we can kill them, and there's, there's enough of us now to find them. So the... But the Bigfoots, 
the actual space Bigfoots, the ones that are still on, on their planet, actually have been seen so many times with, with the small Ryan, uh, Ryan Greys, that's the way I see the, the greys, um, that they are actually working with them. I mean, there's a story from England about a little boy that um, back in, in the wartime was, saw, saw a UFO sort of decloak at the end of his street and there was a what he now calls a Wookiee or, you know, a Chewbacca right. uh, with them, standing there with them. But there's so many stories that you can't sort of... You have to now think that they are, you know, working with with other races. Fascinating. Listen, Ian, it's um, it's a fascinating read, and the way that you've managed to piece it all together, you're to be commended for it. Uh, oh, yeah. Everything is connected. Black Ops, Alien Spirits, Bigfoot, and our untold history. Uh, Ian, again, how do people get a copy of the book? Amazon, uh, Amazon Kindle. And leave us with a website, Ian. Our www ouruntoldhistory.com ouruntoldhistory.com Ian, thanks for hanging out with me. Merry Christmas. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. My website, strangeplanet.ca strangeplanet.ca And there, uh, take some time, spend some time. Uh, There's lots to discover on the website. You can uh, become a member. Go to the radio page for The Conspiracy Show. Click on that blue member button and... um, It's very quick to register. It's free, and that gives you access to member-only areas. Say hello on Twitter, at Richard Serrett, S, Y, because I love you, R, E, double, T. And as always, follow the truth. Richard Serrett's Strange Planet, following the truth wherever it leads. Exposing evil and corruption and the secret machinations of powerful elites. Revealing the high strangeness beneath the surface of our supposed reality. Coming to you from the Great White North and his studio beneath the stairs. Here's Richard.